Dead bodies litter the streets, their skin burned and lesioned, their lips crusted with dry vomit, their eyes milky and white. This isn't the aftermath of a fight, it's the aftermath of a massacre. Nobody here stood a chance against the monster they died fighting. And the monster isn't done. An unnatural shadow moves between the houses, skittering on pointed legs like death itself in the night. Perhaps what the Elder said was true. Only an even more dangerous monster could stop a monster such as this. The survivors all converge in one building, shaking with fear and following the single instruction the Elder gave them. Keep your eyes closed at all costs. And to think, the village was so peaceful until the demon arrived. It is a small, picturesque place nestled in the lush mountains of Chile, hundreds of years before the world became the connected whole it is today. It is a world where that which exists beyond your borders ought not to exist at all. The people there live quiet and simple lives, herding goats and alpacas, growing crops in the hills, tanning, dyeing, and weaving. They are hardy people, acclimated to the often rough and unforgiving life on the slopes. Like most in their time, the people here are ruled by superstition, a firm belief in the existence of gods and monsters beyond the veil. Some would scoff at their faith, call them primitive, but the reality is an open mind will often catch more truth than a closed one, because we all know the truth. There are indeed monsters out there, haunting the dark, always have been, always will be. The main difference is that now we have an organization on our side, a group prepared to die in that dark so we can live in the light. The people of back then weren't so lucky. They were forced to confront the gaping jaws and burning eyes of the unknown with no aid. The same eyes that would soon be turning to the innocent people of this rural, isolated Chilean village. It all began with a missing teenager. The boy was out hunting for game in the forest when his parents realized it had been hours since they'd seen him. As the shadows grow longer and the sky begins to darken, a rescue party forms and ventures out into the wilderness to search for him. Armed with clubs, bows, and arrows, the mountains can be a treacherous place between the harsh terrain and the many dangerous predators who hunt out there too. Little do they know, the boy they are searching for has fallen prey to a new type of predator, one that none of the villagers has ever encountered before. It's another few hours before they find him. One of the men in the search party remarks that the boy seemed to have gone far further than he should when hunting. Another replies that perhaps he didn't venture out here at all. Maybe he was dragged. No one honors that with an answer. They keep their heads down and keep searching. The possibility is too frightening to truly consider. If a dangerous creature has made its home in the forest surrounding the village, then all of them are in trouble. Not long after that, they find the missing teenager, injured and unconscious. He looks pale and sickly, with three ragged claw marks cut into his chest. The silent thought passes between them. What animal has three claws? No animal that they know of. But now is not the time to think of that. They need to wrap the injured boy in blankets before he freezes to death out here or succumbs to his injuries. First, they need to ensure that he survives this. Then, they need to find out what did this to him. Soon, the boy is lying in the home of the town's medicine man, a rudimentary scientific figure with a wide knowledge of herbs and plant-based medicine. But he cannot diagnose the sickness that the boy seems to be experiencing. He has nausea, dizziness, a rattling cough that sometimes produces blood, and his skin is taking an odd, unnatural hue. This can't be the result of his injury, the medicine man concludes. The wounds are actually relatively shallow. This malady must have another source. The villagers pray for the boy and leave offerings and sacrifices at their altars for his recovery. But it does no good. Later that same night, he splutters blood and passes away. His dying words, heard only by the medicine man, is that there is a monster in the forest, and the most frightening thing of all is that he's right. Over the next few days, it gets worse. Far, far worse. The same mysterious affliction that killed the teenage boy starts to spread across the village, infecting the vulnerable and infirm with deathly sickness. Livestock begins to go missing or are found dead when the sun rises, cleaved with the same three deadly razor-sharp claw marks. And if this wasn't all horrific enough, soon the crops begin to die off, as though the same sickness that's hurting the people and the animals is doing the same for them. It's impossible to ignore the reality of the situation now. There is a demon in their midst, and if they don't kill it, 
it will kill all of them. The town holds a meeting in their square, where it quickly becomes apparent how drastically the town's numbers have dwindled. They are a shadow of their former glory. Some men suggest forming a hunting party to rampage through the forest, find this monster, and kill it. Others wisely bring up that this might leave the village's women and children undefended. What if the creature were to attack while they were all in the forest? It would mean certain doom. Frightened discourse soon gives way to a heated argument. People can become violent when they're afraid, and when the thing causing their fear is nowhere to be seen, that violence is inevitably channeled toward one another. However, before things can get out of hand, the brewing calamity is quickly ended by the sound of three firm taps against the ground. They all turn and see the village elder, an old blind man who uses a gnarled walking cane. The crowd falls silent. This man commands ultimate respect among the villagers, and for many, his presence has an immediate calming effect. Perhaps he would finally have a solution to this problem. There is a way, he says with a slow, rattling voice. What is the way, Elder? asks a younger villager. An ancient guardian spirit that lives in the mountains. I can bring it here, and it may be able to help us. But there is one condition, one rule, which must be followed at the cost of all others. None of you may gaze upon this spirit. You must keep your eyes closed. If you see it, a horror far worse than the ones we've experienced here will fall upon this village. With the approval of the rest of the village, the elder makes a rough pilgrimage up into the mountains, made even rougher by his age and infirmity. But the safety of his village is at stake, and there is nothing he won't sacrifice to see that its existence will be maintained. The only thing he carries, other than his walking stick, is a length of rope. Soon he reaches the mouth of a cave, an ancient cavern cut deep into the flesh of the mountain. He enters. As a blind man, the darkness means nothing to him. The cave is silent at first, but soon he hears something, a quiet, pitiful weeping. That is how he knows he's close to the legendary guardian spirit. The old man has never seen this supposed spirit, but if he did, he would know that it is a long, pale humanoid with grasping hands and a terrible face. He knows the beast is capable of great violence, but he also knows that the beast is not evil, for it takes no pleasure in that violence. The elder's knowledge of the guardian spirit in the cave had been passed down for generations in his family. He had been told throughout his childhood about how the guardian spirit defended their village in dangerous and desperate times. When bands of raiders had invaded almost a century ago, the guardian spirit destroyed them. When beasts emerged from the woods, the fear of the guardian spirit warded them off. And here and now, the elder is certain that the guardian spirit would be able to defeat the demon terrorizing them. He takes the rope and ties it around the weeping monster's neck, forming a makeshift leash. He spoke a soothing incantation and exhaled. It's time for you to serve us once again, great spirit, he said. And so begins the treacherous journey back down the side of the mountain. But in his absence, back at the village, the situation is deteriorating. Hours have passed and night is about to fall. The demon only attacks at night when they're most vulnerable. Fear has already poisoned the hearts of many of the village's men. They sequester most of the remaining population away in the village's largest home and arm themselves. They have no faith in the elder's mystic solution. They will find this abomination and kill it themselves. There is no other way. But as they gather in the village square and prepare to lead an assault on the forest, they never would have expected the monster they're hunting to come to them. And in an almighty flash, it appears in front of them. It's even more horrible than they'd ever imagined. A large, spindly beast with black spikes for legs, an emaciated body, the same three black claws that had left those terrible marks on all of its victims. But worst of all is the face, the featureless, tooth-lined maw with a huge, glowing eye inside. It is a monster worse than even what their nightmares could conjure. Before they can even attack it, it unleashes a blast of energy that blows back the ones closest to it leaving them dead or dying, their skin horrifically burnt. Those further back run in to attack the monster, screaming with a fury that they hope will hide their terror. But the monster is far faster than them. It whips out its claws and slashes at them, hitting each one with a deadly kill strike. They aren't able to land a single hit on the beast. As the bodies hit the floor, some try to run, but it's already too late. 
One person attempting to run suddenly feels a pain in his chest. He freezes in place, and then is simply sucked into himself, screaming, crumpling away, and disappearing entirely. While the language to understand how this man died would not be developed for centuries, we today would be able to say that the monster, today known as SCP-001, the prototype, created a singularity within the man's body, absorbing him into himself. The people cowering inside can hear the screams and the terrible sounds of their fellow villagers, their friends, sometimes even their families, being massacred outside. They believe in the Elder and follow his teachings despite their fear. They keep their eyes forced closed. Some of their strongest men have gone out there to face the monster and had been slain. There is truly nothing they can do except wait and hope. Outside, the creature, the demon that had been the ruin of their village, is the only thing still alive. The many bodies of those slaughtered lay twisted on the ground around it. Then, it begins to hunt. It wants to find the others. It gurgles and chitters, its legs making a tack-tack-tack sound on the ground beneath its sharpened points. The surviving villagers do all they can to remain silent as they hear it getting closer. Death itself draws near. Then, someone and something else enter the village. The demon hears them arrive and skitters over to investigate. The elder has arrived. He knows what happened. He can hear the demon. He can smell the burning flesh of the dead. And he has brought another monster on the end of a rope. A guardian spirit. A thing that, centuries later, would become to be known as SCP-096, the Shy Guy. And the demon had made the terrible mistake of looking at its face. The monster began to cry and wail. You have defiled and profaned my village, demon the elder said, speaking over the guardian spirits wailing. This is your divine punishment. You will be removed from the face of the earth for your crimes. The demon releases a blast of radioactive energy, striking the elder directly and killing him instantly. But despite the residual burns from the attack, the guardian spirit is unaffected. It continues to bawl loudly. Then, with the fury and speed of a bullet train, it roars and gallops towards the demon its clawed hands extended. With one strike of the back of the guardian spirit's hand, the demon's body is thrown through a nearby empty house, tearing through the brickwork and sending it skidding across the ground on the other side. The demon rises shakily to its feet, dazed and hurt. It doesn't understand. How had that creature resisted the radiation poisoning? It only showed minor burns. It didn't make sense. It makes even less sense to the demon when the guardian spirit comes bounding through the wreckage of the house, its burns already somehow completely healed. There is no hesitation from the guardian spirit. It leaps towards the demon, and the demon only narrowly dodges the spirit's grasp. It rakes its claws along the spirit's back as it glides past, leaving another three distinctive scars. But by the time the creature lands on all four spindly limbs, the wounds are already seamlessly healing. This is nothing like fighting a mere human being. Perhaps the Elder was right. This creature is a divine punishment, and it really is here to wipe out the demon once and for all. But if that is the case, then this demon won't be going down without a fight. It creates a singularity within the guardian spirit's chest. The spirit doubles over in pain, howling and clawing at the dirt beneath it. But to the demon's surprise, the guardian spirit doesn't crumble like the humans did. The massive amount of radiation being caused as a side effect of the singularity barely seems to phase the beast. The demon strains to increase the power of the singularity within the guardian spirit, but other than causing it to wail and bellow louder, it seems to have no meaningful effect. The demon, on some level, thinks it's as if the creature is held together by an invincible skeleton. No matter what it does, it only seems to be able to leave superficial damage. The monster is unbreakable. The guardian spirit flails and lunges, breaking the demon's concentration and causing the singularity to collapse. Taking advantage of the sudden respite, the guardian strikes the demon on its disgusting, bulbous head, causing it to stumble backwards, dizzied. The demon steadies itself and gives a defensive screech, but the guardian spirit ignores it. Instead, it leaps onto the demon and grabs it. Shocked by the sudden ferocity of its attacker, the demon clawed at the guardian spirit's face, wounding it but not deterring it. The guardian spirit has a grip that would put iron to shame, and despite trying to wriggle free, the demon couldn't seem to escape. As the guardian spirit roars and stretches open its jaws, the demon activates its emergency escape feature. It creates another miniature singularity around itself, a wormhole. 
and vanishes. The demon reappears in the woods, feeling, for the first time in its wretched existence, a pang of mortal fear. At least it was able to escape back into the woods, where it could steal away into the night and fight again another day. It understands its enemy now. It could figure out weaknesses. It could plan, strategize. But its thoughts are interrupted by a familiar, horrific wailing. Shocked, the demon looks up. It sees the guardian spirit bounding towards it across the forest, barging through trees and splintering them into wood chips. How? How had this creature gotten here already? It's as if it has an innate sense of the demon's location. The demon steals itself and summons all of its power. It would need to annihilate the guardian spirit now, or it would be done for. It opens its freakish head, and the eye in its mouth glows, releasing a wave of radioactive heat that bakes earth and disintegrates trees in its path. It catches the guardian spirit in the blinding blast and wipes it out. When the smoke clears, there's nothing left of the guardian spirit but a charred skeleton. The demon approaches, perhaps to investigate the kill, perhaps to take in the victory. But suddenly, the skeleton rears up, already beginning to regrow its flesh, and closes its clawed hand around the demon's throat. The demon screams, but not for long. Hello everyone, Dr. Bob here. I know you're not used to seeing me here at the start of videos, but that's because today we have an extremely pressing matter to attend to. One that cuts to the deepest core of one of the SCP Foundation's deadliest contained anomalies. SCP-096, The Shy Guy. It's a creature that needs no introduction, because it probably haunts all of your nightmares already. Close your eyes and picture it in your mind's eye. That gaunt face with the slack jaw and the lifeless white eyes. The face you hope never to see as long as you live. The pale skin pulled tight against bone those impossibly long, gangly limbs. It sits there in its airtight containment cube, covering its face and quietly sobbing, always sobbing, as though cursing something beyond even its own understanding. Perhaps, when thinking about SCP-096, you feel a pang of sympathy mixed with the terror. After all, this anomaly is no sadist. Why would a sadist cry as it kills, like SCP-096 does? You're not alone in asking this question. I've spent many a night poring over classified files with an ever-freshening pot of coffee, trying to piece together the answers. SCP-096 is considered one of the most dangerous Euclid-class creatures in containment, and yet, so little about it is known, beyond its capability to do great harm whenever someone is unlucky enough to see its face and send it into its rage state. How did this happen? It's a question for the curious, like you or me, and after months of strenuous research, I believe I may have an answer. Whether you choose to believe it is up to you. Just be warned when you hear what I believe to be the heartbreaking, tragic origin of this terrifying and pitiful monster, you may never be able to look at him the same way again. Not that looking at him should ever be high on your list of priorities. It begins in a tavern in a small Nepalese village a few miles away from the Chinese border, where Mount Everest, the world's tallest mountain above sea level, waits. Its mere existence is like a challenge to the brave and foolhardy. Conquer me, it seems to whisper. Conquer me and declare yourself above all those I have conquered. Become a god among men. It's always whispering like this, but few, in the grand scheme of things, can actually hear it. And sadly for him, the explorer is among those few. He's sitting in one of the tavern's many cozy nooks, picking away at a plate of mutton curry while sipping from a brass bowl of white chiang, a popular local drink. The explorer, living up to his name, has come a long way to get here. The rest of the village locals in the tavern eye him with a variety of knowing glances. They've seen so many like him before, smug smiles and puffed chests, thinking they'll be able to count themselves among the exalted few who've conquered the mountain to end all mountains. The bodies of many men like this are still frozen to the mountain's surface. One brave local, an older man who can speak English fluently, slides in across the table from the explorer. The old-timer tells him that whatever he thinks he'll find up on the mountain – honor, glory, recognition – he'd be better off searching for it elsewhere. Death awaits on the icy rocks above. The explorer, young, fit, and still feeling mighty smug, replies that death is there for the people who haven't worked hard enough who haven't prepared. He's scaled other mountains before, all across the globe, from Scotland to Peru. 
Everest would hold no surprises for him, just a new, compelling challenge. The old man is, as you could probably imagine, unamused by the explorer's hubris. All confidence and bluster now, he says with his thin, raspy voice. But what will you say when you are face to face with the king? The explorer, assuming that this king refers to the mountain itself, <laughs> smiles and replies, I'll ask him for his crown. With that, the old man leaves, content that he at least tried to dissuade the explorer from going on this doomed journey. If nothing else, his conscience would be clear now. He had done all that he possibly could. The explorer, not bothered by the grim prophecies of superstitious locals, finishes his curry and chung and retires to the room he rented upstairs. He's so excited. Tomorrow, it will finally be time. All his months of training will pay off. He will climb to Mount Everest's peak. It would be an achievement to last a whole lifetime, one he would never, ever forget, no matter how much he wants to. The next day, the tip of his ice axe cleaves into the mountainside as he grunts, strains, and pulls himself up another few feet. He's about 2,000 meters up, and every additional meter is fighting him. It's the bitterest cold he's ever known, a freeze so deep it makes his incredibly expensive thermal-locking clothes feel like he's wearing wet, one-ply toilet paper. But the pain doesn't matter. The cold doesn't matter. He finds it exhilarating. Of course, just as the old man had warned, death could be waiting for him on this mountain. But the truth is, the explorer has never felt more alive. He winches himself up a few feet more, trying to regulate his breathing as his icy fingers, wrapped in thick gloves, struggle to find purchase on what feels like a sheer cliff face. There are many times when he's supporting his full body weight with only his hands. It often takes the kind of Herculean strength that only a lifetime of training can give you. After all, there's no room for error on Mount Everest. One wrong move, and you're either plummeting to your death or becoming a permanent frozen fixture of the mountainside. And because Everest is so dangerous, nobody comes to collect the bodies of dead mountaineering hopefuls. Their corpses, coated in often colorful winter jackets, litter the mountain. Some look at them as a tragic warning. Other, more morbid mountaineers use them as mile markers for their own more successful ascents. Whether the explorer would be lucky or become just another dead, frozen mile marker is still entirely up to chance. He climbs for a few more hours, pushing past his body's complaints, his physical limitations, until he reaches a well-earned plateau. Here, he establishes a small base camp and eats some of his rations. The area is thankfully guarded enough to keep out the worst of the sub-zero winds, so he can at least get some sleep without freezing to death. Mount Everest cannot be conquered today, and even someone with the explorer's bravado wouldn't dare to try. But as he settles down to sleep for the night, he can't help but look up and the enormity of what stands before him, he finds utterly terrifying. The mountain just keeps going and going and going, stretching up into the misty heavens, like the tip would only be a short jump from the moon. For the first time, the explorer begins to genuinely wonder, will I scale this mountain, or will I die on it? What he never even considers is that there may be a third option that's so, so much worse. Over the next few days, he keeps climbing further and further. Hundreds, then thousands of meters pass under him as he breaks past even the boundaries biology seemed to set for him. He's impossible to deter, an engine of pure, burning willpower, going because he knows he cannot stop. Because he knows that if he throws in the towel now, it will have all been for nothing. He'll be just another failure, one speck among billions. He'll have no meaning, no legacy. He'll just be another average Joe forgotten. And that honestly scares him even more than the prospect of freezing to death up here. Eventually, even though it costs him almost everything to do it, he reaches 8,000 meters, an area known as the Death Zone, where it's believed to be impossible for humans to acclimate. This is the thin, rarefied air that few have been permitted to breathe, and he's seen so many brightly colored mile markers on the way to here. The ground is slippery, and the air chews into the explorer's skin but he knows he's made it this far. Less than a thousand meters from the peak now, he has almost conquered the mountain. So you can only imagine how surprised he feels when he sees another mountaineer walking down the side of the mountain towards him with an eerie kind of casualness. He's wearing standard mountain climbing gear, including white thermal pants and a hooded coat zipped up to the chin. The explorer can't make out the stranger's face, 
beyond the pair of thick, black goggles he's wearing over his eyes. What the hell is going on here? The second the stranger's eyes fall upon him, he feels a frightening sensation. The bite of the cold is gone. The chilling winds can't reach him. Instead, he feels warm, cozy, and content, like he's sitting in front of a warm fire in a well-insulated log cabin. In any other circumstance, these sensations might be welcomed, but a seasoned mountaineer knows that this is actually one of the worst things you can feel. It means that death is creeping in, and your body is opening the front door and welcoming it. And if this stranger is causing that feeling, then one thing is certain. He's bad news. The explorer wants to turn and run, but he finds that he can't. It's almost as though he's frozen in place, entranced by the warm, inviting feeling that the other mountaineer seems to exude as he gets closer and closer. That's when the explorer notices something strange about him. Something is glowing through his goggles, like hot embers, burning a bright, luminous orange. Are those eyes? Dear God, are those his eyes? The explorer can feel their terrible stare, literally feel it. It hurts to be looked at by this monster. Yes, that's what it is. A monster. A monster in the shape of a man. Why are you here, mortal? Comes a booming voice from the inhuman mountaineer. Do you wish to challenge me? The explorer can't form words. He's quaking, his body acknowledging the cold that his mind can't as those two glowing eyes bore into him. Speak, the stranger commands. Who? What? are you? The explorer forces out between chattering teeth. The stranger laughs. I am the king of the mountain. Though to the SCP Foundation, he's better known as SCP-1529, and he's the worst possible thing you can run into while trying to scale Mount Everest. The explorer remembers his conversation with the old man in the tavern. The question he asked, what will you say when you're face to face with the king? And his own foolish answer, I'll ask him for his crown. Now, really, truly face to face with the king of the mountain, all the poor terrified explorer can do is whimper and beg for mercy. Please, he says, the tears freezing on his cheeks as they fall. I just wanted to climb. The king of the mountain gives another booming laugh, his eyes burning. Then you will climb, he says, and climb and climb and climb. The King of the Mountain must have wielded truly unspeakable power to do what he does next. With a simple nod, the explorer is suddenly hanging off of the mountainside, his fingers digging into the craggy rocks, the only thing supporting his weight. It was like being back at square one all over again, except with added pain, terror, and cold so deep he can feel his bones rattling. And all the while, he feels those eyes upon him, those burning, fiery eyes staring with absolute malice. He keeps climbing. Every time he reaches a plateau, a place where he might camp and find even momentary comfort, the king of the mountain is already waiting there, staring that horrible stare. And just like that, the explorer was climbing again, wind whipping against him like forty lashes from a cat of nine tails. That, coupled with the endless strain of the climb on his muscles, is the worst agony he's ever felt. And yet, he never dies even though he hasn't eaten in days, weeks, months, years. He never, ever dies. He just fulfills the same torturous loop over and over again. It's like the King of the Mountain is just keeping him alive for his own amusement, a toy that's impossible to break. But while the explorer never breaks, as time goes on and the torments never cease, he does begin to change, like rock being molded by the tide. First, from the endless stress, his hair falls out, his skin goes pale from the lack of sun. His body becomes thin and wiry from starvation and malnourishment. The endless physical strain even warps his limbs. His arms and legs begin to stretch, his body becoming elongated and grotesque. All the way through this horrific, dehumanizing ordeal, the King of the Mountain stares at him. One day, the explorer, now changed, reaches a plateau, and as can be expected, the King of the Mountain stares at him with his burning eyes. The explorer cowers and covers his face with his hands, sobbing from exhaustion. He just wants the King of the Mountain to look away, to leave him be. He babbles incoherently. He doesn't want to be seen anymore. His pain simply makes the King of the Mountain laugh. I gave you your wish, 
the Mountain King says, his voice oozing with contempt. You climbed, didn't you? You thought that your climbing would elevate you, make you more than human. But now, you're so much less. Our business concludes here. I'm tired of playing with you. And with that, the king is gone. The explorer is alone, stranded among the snow and the whipping winds of the death zone, but very much alive. He's finally able to go. At long last, after what felt like an eternity, he's escaped. When the explorer arrives in the village again, he's not the explorer at all. It's been years since he went missing on the mountain. The old man who had warned him not to go up onto Mount Everest had passed peacefully in the interim. The other members of his small village would not be afforded the same luxury. Instead, the explorer stumbled back through the village limits, still covering his face. The only sounds he can hear are the wailing wind and his own pitiful sobbing. Everything hurts. He's so terribly afraid. He needs somebody to help him. Why will nobody help him? The sun begins to rise, and the village shakes itself awake. People leave their homes to go about their daily tasks. None of them are expecting to see a monster loping through their streets, a pale, gangling monstrosity, stretched and hairless. It engenders a mix of fear and curiosity as it stumbles around, audibly sobbing with a loud, warped voice. It's like nothing any of them have ever seen before, like something out of a myth or a folktale. But for the monster that was once the explorer, it's so much worse. At first, he thinks that the villagers might be there to help him, but then he sees their eyes, that same intense, burning fire pit orange as the king of the mountain, that same horrible gaze that the explorer thought he'd escaped when he'd left the mountain, the gaze that meant pain, torment, and madness. Even when he tries to cover his face, when he wails at them to go away in words that make sense to no one but him, he can still feel those terrible eyes on him. Is he still on the mountain? Is he still at the mercy of the Mountain King? Are these all just illusions or projections, another awful trick? What did he ever do to deserve this kind of torment? Was the crime of wanting to climb a damn mountain worth this kind of everlasting suffering? Did it earn him the gaze of all these monstrous eyes? The explorer begins to feel his anguish being replaced by another feeling, rapidly rising rage, the kind of pure blistering hatred that inexorably leads to one result, violence. First, he screams, then they scream, and finally, the killing begins. The creature that had once been the explorer leaves no stone unturned. Even when they try to run away, he still feels their eyes on him. He needs to kill them all, to annihilate them quickly, leave no trace. It's the only way he can feel anything close to at peace again. It becomes a kind of terrible chain reaction. The sound of the horrors going on in the street only entices more to come outside and see what's going on to look at the creature causing all this carnage, to see its face. They have no idea that this very action is dooming them. And within the hour, the village is empty, save for one creature, the creature that had once been the explorer, now just afraid, confused, and alone. He will always be alone. The anomaly that will soon be known as SCP-096 simply bows its head and weeps. The guerrilla soldiers fire their rifles blindly into the jungle. They don't know what exactly they're shooting at, but something is out there among the trees, something they can't see, something that's killing them. One of the young soldiers, barely more than a boy, stops to reload. As he pulls the magazine from his rifle, a blur passes by. The soldier next to him suddenly drops to his knees, clutching his neck, blood pouring out between his fingers. A hand grasps the boy's shoulder, and he spins around, nearly opening fire on his commander. The older man tells him they've got to go, and the boy joins a small group of soldiers who start running through the jungle, trying to get away from whatever this thing is. As they run, there's another flash of movement, and one of the soldiers is pulled into the trees. He can hear his screams mixed with the otherworldly shrieks, but there's nothing they can do. It's already too late for him. Another soldier disappears into the trees with a blur. It's just him and the commander now. They emerge from the jungle into a clearing that contains a small abandoned farm. The commander motions for them to head towards the old farmhouse, and the two take cover around the corner of the home. They crouch with their guns ready, peeking around the corner, looking for any sign of the monster that's killed so many of their comrades. The boy wants to know what they should do. He opens his mouth to ask the commander, but he puts a finger to his lips and motions for the boy to keep watching. The boy peeks around the corner of the house, 
but he doesn't see anything emerging from the tree line. It's quiet, until the commander begins to scream. The boy turns to see a point forming on his chest. It's a black circle. No, not black, something darker. It's like it is the absence of any and all light. The commander screams louder as the point of darkness grows. The commander's screams fade out, even as it looks like he continues to yell. The boy watches as the commander seems to be collapsing in, sucked into the dark orb in his chest. The commander's body folds in on itself, growing smaller and smaller, until it disappears completely into the black hole, which vanishes along with him. The boy doesn't know what he just saw, but he doesn't have time to think, because emerging from the forest is the creature. The boy has never seen anything like it, and runs into the farmhouse. He locks the door and pushes the old kitchen table in front of it, trying to barricade it as best he can. He looks around and spots a bed against the wall. It's the best hiding spot he can find. So he runs and slides under the bed, pulling himself as close to the wall as he can. The boy watches and waits, unsure of what he should do. It's quiet. There's no more screaming of soldiers being killed or any more of those guttural animal-like squeals. Maybe it decided to go back to wherever it came from. The boy doesn't dare come out from under the bed, though. As he watches the door, waiting for something to burst through, he sees something else. Another of those black points appears in the middle of the room. It looks like it bends the light around it, distorting the room nearby. The boy watches from under the bed as out of the point, a thin black limb emerges. First one, then another. He can see its strange pointed legs with no feet standing just in front of the bed now. With a high-pitched cry, the creature effortlessly tosses the bed aside. The boy is left exposed, cowering against the wall. The creature screams, opening its wide mouth that seems to split its eyeless face in two, revealing two rows of jagged teeth. The boy screams back, crying in fear, and sees that the creature isn't eyeless after all. Inside its grotesque mouth, a milky blue ball appears. There's no iris, but the boy knows whatever this thing is. It's looking at him. The boy feels his chest grow tight. He looks down to see that one of the black points is forming on his chest. He can feel himself being squeezed and crushed, pulled down into this singular point. All noises, including his screams, disappear as he is pulled into this soundless void. But then he hears something again. He looks up to see that the creature is being riddled with bullets. It turns to escape and bursts through the wall of the farmhouse. The dark orb on the boy vanishes, and he sees, standing in the doorway, his friend and savior. He clutches his bleeding throat with one hand, holding his rifle in the other. The boy rushes to him as he collapses to the floor. Blood is pouring out of his neck, and he can no longer speak. But he dies knowing he saved his young friend. The boy starts to feel very tired, and he sits down next to his dead hero. He's all alone now, his entire group of freedom fighters now wiped out by this demon. The boy feels nauseous and dizzy. He coughs into his hand and looks down to see that it's covered in his own blood. A group of boys run down a jungle path laughing and playing, when they suddenly stop and grow quiet. There's something up ahead of them. It's a man, lying on the side of the road. The boys look scared, unsure if they should check it out. But then the smallest of all of them emerges from the group and bravely marches up to the man. Not wanting to let the youngest of their friends make them look like cowards, the rest of the boys soon follow. The man on the side of the road is moaning and looks to be in pain. As they get closer, they can see that he must have been in a terrible accident. His skin is gray, and it looks like his long, thin arms only have three fingers. What should they do? The small boy picks up a stick and reaches out with it to poke the man, not wanting to touch him with his own hands. But before he can, the man rolls over, opening his mouth with a horrible shriek to reveal the glassy blue eye inside as the boys turn and run, hands over their ears. Several weeks later, the small Guatemalan town holds a meeting. The crowd of people in the room are angrily yelling at the mayor, who stands at a podium demanding answers from him about what happened to their dead or missing loved ones. A series of photos are hung on the wall behind the mayor in remembrance of those who have disappeared into the forest or mysteriously died from a rapid illness, including the brave young boy. One man shouts at the mayor, wanting to know where his daughter was. Another asks how her healthy husband could drop dead from an illness after being perfectly healthy only days before. The mayor tries to calm the frustrated townspeople telling them that he knows there have been rumors of a demon out in the forest, but that's all they are, rumors. The mayor warns them, though, that something is out there, though he doesn't know what. There is an animal or man that is making people sick, 
It may also be hunting people. Neither he nor the police know exactly what is going on. But there is good news. A group of men have come to help them. The mayor points towards a stern-looking man in a military uniform who is standing with a small group of other soldiers and a scientist off to the side of the stage. The mayor explains that this man, General Machoy, is from America, and that he's going to help them. The crowd doesn't cheer in the way that the mayor seems to have expected, but they at least stop their yelling as the general steps to the podium and thanks the mayor for the introduction. The general looks over the crowd who are waiting and hungry for answers about the monster that's suddenly begun plaguing their town. He tells them that it is true that he's been sent here by the U.S. government in order to investigate what's been happening and stop whatever threat is out there in the jungle by any means necessary. He can't promise that he'll be able to bring back any of their missing loved ones, but he can at least prevent whatever this is from taking any more. He then gestures to the rest of his group and tells the crowd that the men he has brought with him have been specially trained to deal with this exact type of situation, and that they don't need to worry any longer. The only thing everyone needs to do is stay out of their way, and all will be taken care of. With that, he walks off the stage as the crowd erupts into more shouting. General Machoy stops at the scientists waiting next to the stage. Well, Dr. Ketter, what do you think? The scientist adjusts his glasses and answers, This is what we've been preparing for. The overseers kept telling us this day would come. It looks like it finally has. The group of soldiers led by General Machoy make their way through the dense forest. Dr. Ketter is just ahead of them, using a Geiger counter to follow the creature, the audible clicks of the radioactive entity telling him which way it came. They track the source of the radiation to a clearing in the jungle where a small village once stood. Most of the buildings are overgrown with plants and thick vines, but with it growing dark, this seems as safe a place as they will find to make their camp for the night. The soldiers fan out to search what's left of the town as Dr. Ketter continues looking around for where the radioactive trail might lead them next. As General Machoy is checking out one of the many dark old buildings, one of the older soldiers cries out, Hey General, it looks like this generator still works! With the sound of an old diesel motor coming to life, lights in the village suddenly flicker on. They now have fortifications and light. Though he'd never admit it, General Machoy was feeling nervous about spending the night in the jungle. But now at least some of those nerves were being washed away by the old flickering yellow lights. Later that night, the general is questioning Dr. Ketter on where the creature went. Dr. Ketter is confused, though. His readings showed high traces of radiation leading into this village. The creature came here, he was sure of it, but now he can't figure out where it went. It's as if it came into the village and then simply vanished. Outside, one of the soldiers on watch tells the rest of the group who are sitting around a fire to shut up, that he thinks he saw something in the woods. Everyone immediately springs into action, taking defensive positions and aiming their rifles into the dark tree line. There it is again, he says, as a flash of darkness moves just beyond the clearing. No, it's over here, says another soldier on the opposite side. How could the creature be moving so fast around them? Are there multiple of whatever this is out there? The soldiers form a circle to make sure that the thing can't get behind them. What they can't see is the point of darkness forming behind all of their backs, and the thin pointed legs stepping out of it. The general's radio comes to life. I think we've got something out here, gen- But his message is cut off by screams and the sound of gunfire. General Machoy tells Dr. Ketter to stay inside and runs out of the building where he finally gets a glimpse of the demon that they've been tracking. The tall, thin creature is massacring his squad. It dashes between them at an inhuman speed, using its three-fingered hands to rip the limbs off of some soldiers and slash at others with its razor-sharp claws, opening up their necks or disemboweling them before moving on to the next. The general fires his rifle at the creature and misses, but it's enough to get it to retreat. General Machoy runs back inside the building where Dr. Ketter is waiting. What was it? What did you see out there? The general doesn't know how to begin describing the monster that just killed all of his men. It's like nothing he's ever seen before, in something that no amount of training could prepare him for. As the two men ponder what to do next, the Geiger counter on the table suddenly starts to click, softly at first, but then more and more, as if a huge amount of radiation has suddenly flooded the room. The general grabs the doctor and drags him out, leaping out of the building just before it collapses in on itself, disappearing into the micro-singularity that formed inside. The two men look up to see it standing right in front of them, its huge mouth open to reveal its glassy blue eye. Look out, Dr. Ketter cries, but he isn't talking about the demon as he and the general roll to the side, just avoiding the power line that has been cut loose by the destroyed building. The power line hits the ground and immediately begins to spark, sending out bright pulses of white electrical light, 
The creature cries out with a gut-wrenching scream and collapses to the ground, huddling up into a ball as it tries to cover up its mouth with its thin arms. Is it the electricity? The general asks, confused about what suddenly stopped the killer's rampage. But Dr. Ketter realizes it isn't the sparking power line that the creature has been immobilized by, it's the flashing lights. The general doesn't wait for his answer, though, and fires the weighted net from his gun, trapping the howling creature. Dr. Ketter examines the creature at the field research center that has been set up several miles from the village. A strobe light has been affixed to the inside of the creature's cage, but even when the doctor turns the light off, the grayish-brown-skinned entity still remains curled up in a ball on the floor. The doctor wonders if perhaps the creature is hungry, but it shows no interest in any of the various meats, fruits, and vegetables they've presented to it. The doctor stands in the doorway of the tent that has been set up to house the creature's cage and gives an update to General Machoy, who is anxious to get the creature moved to the United States and a more secure containment environment. Dr. Ketter stresses that he fears the journey might kill this creature, though, and put an end to the incredible research and testing they can perform on this amazing living specimen. The general turns to leave, but stops to salute the body of one of his soldiers being carried by on a stretcher. Dr. Ketter himself turns to go back to his research when he notices something. The creature's mouth is ever so slightly open. Dr. Ketter has yet another idea. That night, Dr. Ketter enters the temporary morgue and takes a severed arm from one of the dead soldiers. Back in the research tent, he presents the arm to the creature, sliding it through the cage bars. The creature doesn't react, but Dr. Ketter continues to watch and wait. After a time, the creature finally stirs. It's the first time he has seen it move since it was captured. The creature reaches out with its long, three-fingered hand and grabs the arm before starting to feed on it. You like that, don't you? Dr. Ketter asks, and bizarrely, the creature seems to respond, giving an almost baby-like coo. There's lots more of that if you behave. All I want is to study you, learn how you work. The creature continues to feed, starting to crunch on the bones now that all the meat is gone. Yes, I believe you'll be good, the doctor says as he approaches the cage. You're going to make me world famous. Soon, everyone will know the name Herman Ket- The creature's hand shoots out from between the bars so quickly he never even saw it. Dr. Ketter starts to scream as it grasps and claws at him. A soldier standing guard outside runs in, but a black point of light immediately appears on his torso, causing him to fold in on himself into the singularity. The creature drops the bloody Dr. Ketter to the floor, who reaches for the emergency strobe light activation button as another singularity opens up inside of the cage. The creature appears to willfully step into it before emerging out of another just outside of the bars. More soldiers rush into the tent in time to see the creature feeding on the still-living Dr. Ketter. One presses the button to activate the high-powered strobe lights, which cause the creature to start screaming and thrashing about, trying to escape the flashing lights. Multiple nets are fired onto the creature, pinning it to the ground as its screams slowly fade back to whimpers. On overseer orders, the creature is moved to ADRX-19, a secure base located somewhere in North America. The site's director gives a presentation to a group and explains that thanks to the work of the late Dr. Ketter, they now know that the creature exhibits signs of fear and sickness when in the presence of strobing lights, and that it is unable to produce the micro-singularities that it uses for defense and teleportation when it is in this sickened state. When healthy, though, the creature is extremely dangerous thanks to its superhuman speed, strength, and cunning. It was also discovered that it is unable to teleport through lead, which its new containment cell has been lined with, and extreme security procedures have been implemented, including the installation of a reinforced steel blast door and constant patrols of the outside of the cell by armed guards who are equipped with high-powered strobe lights. The site director leaves the room and the overseers discuss the fate of the creature, which has been given the designation number 86243AR-001, though most have taken to calling it simply 001. One of the overseers argues that the creature must be secured and contained in order to protect humanity. Who knows how many more of these might be out there? They now know that the rumors of these types of entities aren't merely isolated events, and that there could be countless more of these anomalies. Hundreds, maybe even thousands. The rest of the overseers unanimously agree. One of them picks up the report that was left behind by the site director. Redact this report immediately and start a new document archive. This is only the prototype. I have the feeling there will be many more of these. It began, as most bad things do, with the evil mechanizations of one Dr. Evo Robotnik. This rotund mad scientist had been terrorizing the world of Sonic the Hedgehog and his animal friends for decades, with a single-minded task motivating his every diabolical action. 
getting his hands on the Chaos Emeralds and the Master Emerald that controls their power. This would allow him to strangle the natural beauty of the world around him and develop it into a cold, unfeeling world of machinery. None would survive his terrible wrath. The problem was, by this point, far too many people had, in fact, survived his terrible wrath. For many, many years now, despite a multiplicity of evil plans, Sonic the Hedgehog and all his cool, super-powered animal friends had thwarted him countless times. No matter how ingenious his plots were, no matter how many or how powerful robots he built to fight on his behalf, he would always be defeated, and it was starting to get extremely frustrating. It was in this state of near-maddening rage and spite that Dr. Robotnik created what would soon become his most dangerous and deadly invention a trans-dimensional snatcher, a device that would allow him to reach into other dimensions and pluck out dangerous beings, beings that would become living weapons, tools in his arsenal to fight that blasted hedgehog and all the others. Little did he know, he was about to tangle with a creature far more dangerous than anything he could ever hope to be. His mouth twisted into a devious grin, Dr. Robotnik stood in front of the trans-dimensional snatcher with his finger poised over a big, red button. Yes, yes, this would be the perfect plan. Sonic would never stop him now. He pressed the button and watched as the machine gave a mighty, almost blinding flash. As the resulting smoke cleared, Dr. Robotnik saw the creature he'd summoned cowering on the platform before him. It was gray and emaciated, shivering and weeping, covering its face. Immediately, Dr. Robotnik's face fell. Was that it? Some weeping, stretched freak? He wanted something more exciting, like a giant killer lizard or monstrous zombie that melts everything it touches. What could possibly be the combat potential of this pathetic creature? In his frustration, Robotnik kicked the cowering beast. It would be the last mistake he'd ever made, because the creature in question was, as you'd probably guessed, SCP-096. And as any SCP Foundation enthusiast knows, there are two ways to activate 096's infamous rage state. One is looking at his face, and the other is attacking him. Dr. Robotnik had just made a literally fatal mistake. As the crying turned into wails of rage, 096 leaped onto him, freakishly stretching its bottom jaw into a yawning black chasm of a mouth. Nearby, Sonic the Hedgehog, who was, of course, gliding along at the speed of sound, heard Dr. Robotnik's horrific screaming. He immediately recognized the scream as that of his arch enemy, and yet, the scream was so blood-curdling that even he couldn't deny it made him concerned for his old foe. Thankfully, it didn't take the blue super speedster very long to investigate the source of Dr. Robotnik's death rattles. He ran at hypersonic speeds until he reached Dr. Robotnik's base, where an eerie silence had now fallen. Sonic felt a chill in the air, with uncharacteristic caution. He began creeping through the metal halls of Robotnik's lair. Soon enough, he started seeing blood on the walls. Blood, but no bodies. What had happened here? Soon after, Sonic found out. He walked into the room that had once been the home to the transdimensional snatcher, where the shy guy sat crouched in the middle of an empty, bloody room, weeping. Something about all this was terribly wrong. Sonic could hear it. That's when one of his feet clanked against the metal floor, and the shy guy looked up to view him. Sonic almost felt the breath leave his body when he saw that monster's horrible face. He'd never seen anything like it before. That's when the thought crossed his mind. Had this monster murdered Dr. Robotnik? As though activated by the sudden intrusion, the shy guy gave a monstrous wail, then lunged towards Sonic. Luckily for Sonic, his incredible speed came in handy here, darting out of the monster's clutches and whizzing out of the base. But despite his speed, the shy guy somehow still seemed to have an innate sense of Sonic's location. It began to bound after him, tearing its way through the walls of the base like tissue paper. It would slaughter the strange blue creature that had seen its face, destroy it, and leave nothing left. Meanwhile, Sonic was already speeding away. His greatest asset had always been his truly supernatural speed, but he couldn't run forever. And one look over his shoulder revealed a distant white dot behind him. It couldn't be, could it? He was moving so fast that the normal eye couldn't perceive him, so how could any living being possibly even be that far behind him? This monster really is built different, huh? He said to himself. The shy guy was gaining speed behind him. He couldn't even see Sonic, but he could sense his distant presence, the one who'd looked at him, the source of his rage. This strange little blue creature was certainly fast, but unlike Sonic, 096 was literally incapable of getting tired. 
The turtle always beat the hare in the end, and it would be the same here eventually. Sonic was smart enough to know that he probably couldn't beat something like this in a fight, especially if it had literally annihilated Dr. Robotnik. If he had any hope of beating this beast, he'd need to get some friends on his side before things went truly south. The person Sonic was looking for here was Tails, a flying two-tailed fox who was also one of Sonic's closest friends, who lived in the Green Hill Zone. Tails, Tails! Sonic yelled at breakneck speed. What's wrong, Sonic? Tails asked, visibly concerned. No time to fully explain. There's something after me, some kind of monster, Sonic said. Get everyone you can. We're going to need all the help we can get if we want to stop this thing. Before Tails could even get another word in, Sonic tore off again in the opposite direction. If this thing was following him, he didn't want to lead him straight to Tails. But the last thing Sonic was expecting was that the monster had somehow closed the distance, and now it was heading right for him. Sonic didn't even have time to course correct. A long, wiry arm shot outwards and whacked Sonic in the side of the head, sending him skidding across the grass. The shock of an enemy catching up to him like this rattled him even more than the pain of the hit, but there was no time to dwell. Sonic looked up from the ground and saw the shy guy barreling towards him, bellowing madly and digging its claws into the dirt. You just don't know when to give up, do you? Sonic said. Just before the shy guy's claws reached him, Sonic darted out of the way at the speed of light. Even then, the shy guy seemingly had an innate sense of his location. There was no way to trick or outrun the shy guy. It just kept running, no matter what. It was utterly relentless. If Sonic wanted to survive while Tails found reinforcements, he needed to fight back. Before the shy guy could lunge for him, Sonic lunged for the shy guy at impossible speeds, kicking the monster in the chest with both feet. The force of the kick, charged by super speed, sent shy guy rolling back across the dirt. Sonic hoped that this attack might incapacitate it, but no. The shy guy immediately rose to its hands and feet. It was ready to go again. For the first time in quite some time, Sonic was afraid. Thankfully, this time, he wasn't alone. The shy guy prepared to lunge when a spiked fist collided with the side of his face, laying the beast out temporarily. It was Knuckles the Echidna, a powerful pugilist who also acted as the guardian of the Master Emerald, the Chaos Emerald that controlled all of the other Chaos Emeralds. If Knuckles punched you, then you better believe you're gonna feel it. Tails called me. Is this ugly punk giving you trouble, Sonic? Knuckles asked as the shy guy began getting back up its semi-smashed face repairing itself. You have no idea, Sonic said. Sonic and Knuckles were now taking on the Shy Guy two-on-one, making things a little more even, but they were still up against a ruthless, savage killer without compare. And now, Knuckles had seen its face too. The Shy Guy leaped forward, trying to grab Knuckles with its grasping claws. Sonic darted in just in time and grabbed Knuckles out of the way. As the Shy Guy grasped at the empty air, Knuckles jumped in and gave the screaming monster another mighty punch. The sheer force of it left the creature wobbling on its feet, but it still wasn't enough. Lucky for Sonic and Knuckles, they were about to get some help from the big guns. Literally. Bullets suddenly perforated the Shy Guy's body, distracting the monster. It turned and saw yet another one of Sonic's allies, Shadow the Hedgehog, wielding a customized M16 assault rifle. He was wearing a devious smirk. Oh, Sonic. He said, when will you learn that your actions have consequences? Having attacked the shy guy, Shadow the Hedgehog was added to his kill list. It seemed he was making a lot of new enemies today in this strange new place. But there was still one more ally left to come. Suddenly, the shy guy felt a presence behind him, as though someone had just teleported there. It was a purple creature, similar to Sonic, though far more extreme, named Cold Steel the Hedgehog. He was wielding a desert eagle in each hand. Huh, nothing personnel, kid, Cold Steel chuckled. Before the Shy Guy could make another move, Cold Steel turned and unloaded the magazines of his two pistols into the Shy Guy, while Shadow provided suppressing fire with his M16. Meanwhile, Knuckles kept punching at the monster, and any time the Shy Guy attempted to attack one of them, Sonic sped in and pulled them out of harm's way. They were a perfectly organized team, and soon enough, the Shy Guy was temporarily incapacitated. Looks like he's down, but not for long. Sonic said, it's time to finish this. That's when Tails descended, his arms filled with the last thing they needed to conclude their terrifying ordeal, the Chaos Emeralds. And with the help of Knuckles' Master Emerald, they could send this abomination back to wherever it came from and never worry about it again. With the power of the Chaos Emeralds, there was another almighty flash, just like the one that had brought the monster here. 
When the smoke cleared, the monster was gone, returned to the place from whence it came. Sonic sighed and said, Well, at least we don't have to deal with Dr. Robotnik anymore. You've seen his face before, probably during a particularly distressing bout of sleep paralysis. His appearance can vary a bit from manifestation to manifestation, but a few traits are always present. He resembles an elderly man, his touch corrodes everything in his path, his presence creates a disgusting, black, mucus-like substance thought to be a method of pre-digestion of his prey, and he is rotting. No matter his appearance, he is always in some stage of decomposition, gray skin sloughing away from yellowed bone, eyes milky and flat but brimming with malice, wide, toothless mouth stretched into a wicked grin. The entity is incredibly difficult to contain, its corrosive properties and ability to vanish into solid matter and disappear into its pocket dimension layer make it a threat as unpredictable as it is dangerous. The smell of decay and the presence of visible corrosion on any surfaces nearby may be the only warning a person gets before the old man grabs them in his decomposing arms, dragging them off to a painful, terrifying demise. We know where the being disappears to and have learned a great deal about how he operates, but where did he come from? It is the year 2000. Dr. Robert Scranton and his wife, Dr. Anna Lang, are the head researchers at SCP Foundation Site 120. Over the course of their happy relationship, the two have been working on an experimental research project, an early prototype reality anchor device called the Lang Scranton Stabilizer. After a lot of late nights at the office, working and reworking the theory, it is, at long last, ready for testing. Dr. Scranton is standing in Reality Lab A, as Dr. Lang observes from a nearby room. He follows the same routine he has followed each time they tested the LSS, walking down a line of buttons and levers, pressing and flipping each into place. The little red blinking light signifies that the microphone is recording his every comment and observation. Suddenly, the routine is broken by a low rumbling sound from deep, deep within the earth. The ground beneath him begins to shake, and Dr. Scranton stumbles, losing his balance as the once solid floor begins to roil and quake as the seismic shift rolls through the site. He hears the unmistakable grind and splintering of metal and plastic as the LSS-2 begins to shake, components sliding out of place and breaking off. Nearby, Dr. Lang's monitor goes dark as the security feed is cut short by the earthquake's damage. Robert! She screams, making a break for the door and rushing to Reality Lab A, terrified that she will find her husband's body lying on the floor. When she and the guards reach the room, however, they find… nothing. Well, not nothing entirely. The room is a wreck, bits of machinery strewn across the floor, the smell of burning plastic in the air. But the Lang Scranton Scrambler's control panel and Dr. Robert Scranton are nowhere to be found. Dr. Lang falls to her knees in the suddenly empty room, pounding at the floor in despair. Where did he go? She demands, but of course, no one knows the answer. No one wants to say what they're thinking. Wherever he is, Dr. Scranton is probably dead. Probably long, long gone, and he is never coming back. But no one says it, not out loud. They just think it, and keep thinking it, for the next five years, eleven months, and twenty-one days. The time passes, and most everyone forgets about Dr. Robert Scranton everyone except for Dr. Anna Lang. She never gives up hope, never lets go of the possibility that somewhere, in another world, another time, on another planet, her love is still alive. One day she wakes up and it's December 23, 2005, a day like any other, save for its uncomfortable proximity to the holidays she struggles to celebrate nowadays. But then, in the middle of the day, something impossible happens. The LSS control panel reappears in Reality Lab A. It isn't how anyone last saw it, though. It's coated in some sort of unidentified organic matter, and it reeks of blood, vomit, and decay. As her colleagues try to shield her from the sight, try to warn her away, Dr. Anna Lang wades into the area, desperate for a glimpse at any sign of her husband's fate. As she makes her way into the containment field, she is unable to contain her horror. Oh God, what the hell, what, what, what is all this? This, this is, this is the, oh God, Robert, Robert, is this you? Oh God, please, please, no, don't let it be you, don't let it be you. Robert, I thought, I thought, how can this thing be? Her colleagues try to stop her, but she touches the Lang Scranton stabilizer interface and it fires to life. It still works. Somehow it still works. She racks her brain for what to do next before saying, access audio log. Playback starting from January 2nd, 2000. 
The machine prompts her to verbally state her password, and her voice shakes as she replies, Password is Anna Bobana. Request acknowledged. Processing. The machine replies, I'm sorry, there are no audio logs for January 2nd, 2000. Dr. Scranton accessed log on January 13th, 2000 via voice recognition at time. Anna slams her hands down on the machine with a cry. Play back now, damn it, play it back. A researcher warns her not to touch any of the material with her bare hands, but she doesn't hear him. She's too busy, calling out to Robert, hoping that somehow, somewhere, he can hear her. There's so much blood here, there's so much... Honey, are you okay? Where did you go? Oh god, oh god, oh god. Something small and metallic clatters to the floor, lost in the sludge. She retrieves it, wipes it off on her lab coat, and holds it to the light. She would recognize it anywhere. She slipped it onto her true love's finger on the happiest day of her life. It's Robert's wedding ring. Her knees buckle at the realization. She collapses to the ground, and her head cracks against the floor. One of her colleagues snaps into action. Report, this is Dr. Matthew Skinner reporting from Site 120 Reality Lab A. I need medical attention here immediately. Once Dr. Lang recovers from her fall, she demands access to the rematerialized control panel. She's going to go through the audio logs one by one and find out exactly what happened to her husband, even if the truth is as ugly as she fears. The machine whirs to life, and her lost love's voice emanates from the speakers. Name, Robert Scranton, age... 39. Birthday, September 19th, 1961. Favorite color, blue. Favorite song, living on a prayer. Wife, Anna. She has green eyes. I love her very much. He repeated these simple truths to himself for days, before he even realized that the control panel was picking up his voice. My name is Robert Scranton. Yeah. Yeah, my name is Robert Scranton, former researcher at Foundation Site 120. It has been... I don't know, actually. I I can't remember. I, I estimate it's been ten days, but I, I, I don't... I, I can't... Oh, God. Can anyone hear me? I, I, I don't know what's happened. I, I don't know where I am. And, and please, please, is anyone there? Hello? Anyone? Anyone? He began keeping track of how much time passed as best he could. Two weeks, three days, seven hours, and fifty-eight minutes. Oh, Jesus. Back at the Foundation, with at least a tenuous knowledge of where Dr. Scranton could be, personnel try their best to stage some kind of rescue effort. A mobile task force team is ordered to attempt to replicate the experiment with a hastily assembled Lang Scranton stabilizer copy. The result is an explosion that kills three of them. Senior researchers also approach SCP-343, a powerful reality warper known to some as God, hoping to get some insight from him about where Dr. Scranton could be found. His response is, He's beyond any of us now. I'm truly, dreadfully sorry. Anna starts having nightmares. She twists and turns in bed, haunted by visions of her beloved Robert consumed by darkness. A strange specter starts to appear in her dreams, a man with a horrible, rotted face. She turns to her bedside table in the night, numbers blurry on the screen of her alarm clock. The photograph of herself and Robert that she keeps there. Something is wrong with him, wrong with his face. Is it that same awful, rotted man? She screams and closes her eyes when she opens them photo is normal again. She weeps into her pillow. It can't keep going on like this. This place, it's it's some sort of reality gap, I think. If I don't concentrate on it, it's fine, but I feel this tingling all over my face. I'm not sure why. Two months, 15 days, four hours. Anna begins to accept the horrible truth. She may not see Robert ever again, and holding on to the foolish fantasy that she will is starting to kill her. She repeats it to herself like a mantra at work. Robert Scranton is dead. Robert Scranton is dead. Robert Scranton is dead. One day, a co-worker notices her muttering and strikes up a conversation. It's been years since Robert disappeared. What's the harm in talking to someone again? She even finds herself smiling and laughing at his jokes. But when he asks if she'd like to go for coffee, she gets a flash of Robert screaming in the darkness, of that terrible, rotted face grinning. She runs to the bathroom 
to throw up and weep. The tingling in my face has worsened. I wish I could sleep here, but all this damn gunfire overhead. I can't take it anymore. I can't take it. Trench foot. Shell shock. Hell would be reprieve in a place like this. And all the men, all the poor souls who look up to me, call me Corporal. What a jerk. To think I have any more idea of what's going on here. Anna can hear it in his voice. He's getting worn down. As Anna feels her emotions start to dull and fade, she begins accepting more dangerous assignments from her superiors, perhaps hoping just to feel something again. She works on the SCP-682 case, trying to devise more futile termination methods. She spends time with SCP-939, the abominations known as With Many Voices, until they start to imitate Robert's voice, and she knows that she can't do this anymore. She works with SCP-280, Eyes in the Dark, feeling no fear whatsoever as it floats towards her. The worst thing that could possibly happen to her has happened already. Now, she's just waiting, killing time. She has no idea of the further horrors to come. Lately, I've been hearing whispers in the dark. I think the rats are talking to me. <laughs> Funny. My troops must think me mad. What does it matter? This is a mad place, a mad time. A mad man is perhaps best suited to a time like this. So many went over the top yesterday, only to be cut down by machine gun fire. Isn't it odd that I laughed? It was so funny. I think perhaps this mental malady is connected to a physical one. Nosebleeds and vomiting spells. A strange black liquid. Faintly acidic to the touch, but so uh, delicious, so fun. My troops tell me I look unwell, like anything about this is well. Maybe I'll sneak into one of their bedsits tonight and teach them to lighten up a bit. None of them smile anymore. Me, I'm always smiling. I'll teach those little cowards to smile too. But as she listens to more of the logs, she's forced to reckon with the fact it really isn't him anymore. Not as she'd ever known him. He'd become something else. All the others are dead. <laughs> All my good, hard work making them dead. I followed them down the length of the trench. Their silly little bullets didn't hurt me. Oh no. Oh, no, no, no. The look on their faces. All the screaming as they saw me. How thrilling to savor their fear as I approached. All those screams. What are you, you horrible old man? I showed them what I am. I can walk through walls now, you know. Have all the fun I want. Yes, yes, yes. Nothing can hurt me anymore. And I can hurt everyone. And when the war is over, I'll go home. Go home to my sweetheart. I know she's waiting for me. I can't wait to see her, to touch her beautiful face. My lovely, lovely Anna. Hearing him like this, so broken, so utterly transformed. It's too much for her to bear. But the work always needs her, and she returns to it day after day. One night, she sits up late, making her way through a stack of paperwork. When she hears it, a curious sound. Drip, drip, drip. Something thick dripping steadily onto the floor behind her. The smell of rot fills her nostrils, making her gag. She turns, and comes face to face with SCP-106, dripping its slimy black mucus onto the floor, bringing decay to everything it touches. It reaches out toward her, grasping at her arm. She breaks free, but not before its touch melts away the fibers of her lab coat, threatening to seep through the fabric to her skin. All the while, it's staring straight at her, like it knows her. Anna runs out of the lab as fast as she can, shouting for help. A guard tries to come to her assistance, firing his weapon at the old man, but the bullets don't leave a dent, don't even slow him down. 
The old man grabs the weapon from the guard's hands, letting the metal rust, warp, and melt in his grasp. Then he turns his corrosive touch on the guard's face. Anna screams in horror at the sight, but she can do nothing to help him. All that she can do is keep running and hope that the monster doesn't catch her. She runs as fast as her legs can carry her, but she isn't as young as she once was, and years of sitting at a desk have made her muscles stiff and weak. Her foot hits the ground at just the wrong angle, and she stumbles, falling to the ground. She scrambles back to her feet, but when she looks up, something is horribly wrong. Her surroundings have changed. It looks like the Foundation site, but it's not quite the same. It's as if someone tried to recreate the facility from memory and couldn't retain all of the details. Then she hears it again. The drip, drip, drip. He's here. She spins around, and there it is. That awful face, so close to her own. She takes a trembling step back, when suddenly, the monster speaks. <laughs> it's him. She knows it, as surely as she knows that she is about to die. The monster that once was Robert Scranton reaches out and caresses Anna's cheek with his wrinkled hand. She screams as the skin begins to droop, and he seals her lips with a kiss that makes her insides drip like melting wax. The two become one once again. A young man tosses and turns in bed. He adjusts his pillow and tries sleeping on his back, his side, his stomach, but nothing works. He rolls over to check the time, 3 a.m. This is the third night in a row he hasn't been able to fall asleep. He feels tired, he wants to sleep, but every time he closes his eyes and sleep starts to creep in, Something happens, and suddenly, he's wide awake again. It's as if someone keeps flipping a switch in his brain to awake, and there's nothing he can do to stop it. It's affecting everything in his life. He can't concentrate in class, his work performance goes down the drain. Even his hobbies become completely unenjoyable. All he wants to do is sleep. His friends and family can tell something is wrong. It's as if he has become a different person and they urge him to go see a doctor. But the doctors tell him there's nothing they can do for him. He's perfectly healthy otherwise. He should try some natural remedies like valerian root and get more exercise. He has no idea how many days he's been awake now. Four, five, maybe more. At this point, the lack of sleep isn't even the worst part. It's the hallucinations. Sometimes they're just a shadow dancing outside of his vision, but others, are incredibly vivid, feeling more real than his now dreary life does. He had to stop going to work and class entirely since he can't concentrate for more than a couple of seconds at a time. His friends don't want anything to do with him, and who can blame them? He has uncontrollable mood swings and lashes out for no reason. He's tried every sleep remedy there is. He took the doctor's advice and exercised as hard as he ever has, but with never being able to sleep. He has no energy left. He's becoming a living zombie. He gets up out of bed, but loses his balance and collapses to the floor. He tries to get up, but he can't. He'll just lie there for a while. He starts to drift away, and he readies himself for the jolt that always wakes him back up. But this time, it doesn't come. The wave of sleep that starts to wash over him feels different this time, though. It's heavier, more peaceful, and more permanent. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-966, also known as Sleep Killer. SCP-966 is the designation that the SCP Foundation has given to a creature that belongs to a group of anomalous predatory beasts, standing 1.4 to 1.6 meters tall and weighing roughly 30 kilograms, these hairless humanoids have an elongated face, a mouth full of pointed needle-like teeth, and each of their hands has five razor-sharp claws that can be up to 20 centimeters in length. Though unlike humans and apes, they are digitigrade, meaning that they walk using only their toes. But you won't be able to see the horrible visage of SCP-966 under normal circumstances, as they are only visible under very specific lighting conditions. They can only be viewed under light that has a wavelength between roughly 700 and 900 nanometers, which is just at the edge of the light spectrum that's visible to humans, stretching into what's known as infrared light. 
The only exception to this is if their skin, muscles, or organs have suffered from second or third degree burns, in which case, the affected areas of their body will show up under a greater spectrum of wavelengths that are visible to the human eye. Though frightening to look at, SCP-966 are actually quite weak physically, with very low muscular density. Their bones are hollow, similar to birds, and while their claws may be incredibly sharp, they are also easily broken, making them unsuited for use in combat. Additionally, they do not rest through sleep, but will, at seemingly random times, stop all movement and fall into a rest period that lasts roughly three to five minutes, after which they are able to resume their normal behavior. With all of these physical shortcomings, how did SCP-966 gain a reputation as such a fearsome hunter? The secret lies in their ability to emit bursts of a previously unknown type of wave. Hunting either alone or in pairs, SCP-966 uses this wave to inhibit its prey's ability to enter any of the restful sleep stages, and also stops the ability to micro-sleep. These waves have been observed to be effective at up to 20 meters, though tests have shown that they can be blocked by post-transition metals, of which lead appears to be especially effective. SCP-966 hunts and feeds on medium to large-sized animals, which includes humans, and once their quarry has been targeted by the sleep-inhibiting waves, the effect is permanent, with no method having yet been discovered that will allow them to regain the ability to sleep. Experiments have shown that unconsciousness can be induced in other ways, such as with the use of general anesthesia, though these methods have ultimately proven to be ineffective, since although the victim is unconscious, they are still not receiving any of the restful benefits of sleep while in that state. The effects of sleep deprivation on humans, both mentally and physically, are devastating. Symptoms can begin setting in after just 24 hours that can include mood swings, memory issues, and sensory impairment. After two to three days, the body's hormones become deregulated and bodily functions like hunger, thirst, and temperature fluctuate wildly as cognitive abilities start to dramatically decline. Hallucinations, paranoia, and fits of rage are common, and the risk of death from sleep deprivation increases with each day that passes without sleep. And this is exactly what SCP-966 wants. After surreptitiously sending a burst of sleep deprivation waves at their victim, they will then stalk their prey until lack of sleep finally leads to total incapacitation, at which point SCP-966 consumes them. SCP-966 have proven to be both extremely quiet and agile when hunting. However, they have actually been observed intentionally making threatening noises around their prey, presumably to further increase their already elevated stress levels and potentially hastening their mental degradation. On rare occasions, they will even physically assault their victim to further degenerate their mental and physical health. Some of SCP-966's prey will experience especially intense hallucinations and bouts of rage, which is theorized to be caused by prolonged exposure to multiple instances of their sleep-stopping waves. Why some victims are exposed to multiple waves when a single instance has been shown to be 100% effective is unknown and it's hypothesized that they may only engage in this behavior when especially hungry, to try and speed up the process. Though others have put forth the theory that SCP-966 may take some perverse form of joy in seeing its victims suffer prior to expiring. Wild instances of SCP-966 have been found across the globe, and while the SCP Foundation has been successful in thinning their numbers, they still exist in high enough numbers to pose a serious threat to humanity. For these reasons, they have been assigned the classification Euclid. Mobile Task Forces IOTA-1 and IOTA-2, codenamed the Dream Hunters and Air Chasers respectively, are continually monitoring for any reports of sudden or violent deaths related to sleep deprivation in order to identify and neutralize the remaining instances of wild SCP-966. Four SCP-966 specimens, three males and one female, have been acquired by the Foundation and they are currently contained in a 10 by 10 meter room that is lined with lead and equipped with infrared security cameras. Each specimen is fed 20 kilograms of meat each month, and in the event that the female specimen gives birth, the new specimen is to be taken for observation and study before being disposed of prior to reaching maturity. A young man is in the middle of one of his regular night jogs through the park. He loves running through this park at night. It's dark, the air is cool, and the sounds of the city that surround the park disappear, offering peace, quiet, 
and a small reprieve from the busy world. He jogs along a path that winds through the park and starts upon a section that is surrounded on both sides by tall trees. He follows the path around a sharp bend and is stopped in his tracks. Standing there, in the middle of the track, is a figure. It has its back to him and isn't moving. He's tall and so uniformly black that he almost disappears into the night. Whoever or whatever this is, he's scared of it. But the creature doesn't move, and neither does he. He's frozen, unsure of what to do, when the creature suddenly turns his head towards him, revealing a pair of bright, glowing eyes. The runner is so terrified he can't even scream. He falls and crawls backwards in the dirt, trying to get away from the creature. The creature turns its body towards him and begins stepping forward. The runner scrambles to his feet and runs. He's sprinting as hard and as fast as he can, adrenaline pumping, heart pounding, trying to put as much distance as he can between himself and that, that thing. His muscles burn, his lungs ache, but he can't stop. Finally, he's back at his house. He bursts through the door, locking and bolting it behind him. His girlfriend is reading on the couch and doesn't understand what's going on. After struggling to catch his breath, he tries to explain what he saw on the path, but his girlfriend just laughs. A giant man with glowing eyes? He was just seeing things in the dark. It was probably a dog, nothing that would justify the panic he was now in. The next day, he's left wondering if he really was mistaken. Those piercing, glowing eyes are burned into his mind, though. Maybe his girlfriend was right, and it really was just a dog. Yes, that must be it. His mind was just playing tricks on him in the dark. Even so, he's going to stick to running inside, at least for a little while. But he soon finds that he's having a hard time. He notices that he's running out of breath much quicker than normal. Is he coming down with something? He doesn't feel sick. But then why is he suddenly so weak? Two weeks have passed since he saw something in the park. No one he brought it up to, not his friends, not his co-workers, have ever heard of such a thing. And no one seemed like they believed him either. At this point, he is feeling sure that he really did imagine it, but he can't get that image of whatever it was out of his head. He can't keep running on a treadmill forever, though. He misses his night runs. It's time to get over his fear. He's running through the park again, enjoying the silence and the light breeze on his skin. He continues down the path, acutely aware that he's getting closer and closer to the spot where he saw that thing before. He can't stop, though. He has to prove to everyone that he's not afraid. He has to prove it to himself. He reaches the part of the path that runs through the tall trees. Just like before, the sounds of the city melt away, the only sound coming from his steady, heavy breathing. He follows the winding path and feels his heart starting to race, but he has to keep going. He rounds the same corner and nothing is there. He slows to a stop. Of course nothing is here. Nothing ever was. He really did imagine it. Or did he? Buongiorno. Today's file comes from the Italian branch of the SCP Foundation, SCP-015-IT, also known as the Boogeyman. SCP-015-IT is a humanoid entity that stands just under two meters tall. Its body is devoid of any hair, and its dark, black skin absorbs 98% of all light, making it virtually invisible in low light. Its head lacks a nose or ears, but these missing features are hardly noticed, because if you see 015-IT, its eyes are what demand all of your attention. While the boogeyman's skin is completely black, its eyes contain light-producing organs on the irises, causing them to glow in the dark, like a deep-sea predator. Its mouth contains eight pointed teeth on both the upper and lower jaws, and a long 28-centimeter forked tongue. The two tips of its tongue each have a hollow, needle-like organ that leads straight into its esophagus. More on what it does with that specialized biological feature soon. Physically, SCP-015-IT is rather slight, but it is surprisingly strong and easily able to overpower an adult human. Its skinny arms are much longer than an average human's, and each of its four fingers ends in a razor-sharp claw. It has also been shown to be quite resistant to physical injuries and possesses the ability to heal wounds and damage to internal organs at a hyper-accelerated rate. SCP-015-IT is primarily active at night, which is unsurprising given its skin's natural camouflage in the dark. The Boogeyman hunts mammals, with humans being its preferred prey. But it does not feed on flesh. 
Instead, SCP-015-IT draws its sustenance from the adrenaline and noradrenaline produced by its quarry. Adrenaline and noradrenaline are chemicals the body produces to increase heart rate, blood flow, and provide more energy to the muscles in moments of stress, or in the case of SCP-015-IT, extreme fear. And it has developed a hunting method to cause this exact reaction in humans. 015-IT will usually hide in dark spots, trying to keep out of sight as much as possible as it stalks its next victim. If it has been able to remain unseen, it will wait for a moment when its prey has become distracted so it can silently approach them. Once close enough, it will leap towards its unaware victim, grab them, and quickly bite them on the side of the torso, near where the adrenal gland is located. It uses its large teeth to anchor its mouth in place as it uses the needles on its forked tongue to probe into their body. With one needle, it pierces directly into the adrenal gland and begins draining the blood that is now rich with fear-induced adrenaline. At the exact same time, the other needle releases a mild sedative, allowing 015-IT to feed and then depart without risk as the victim remains immobile. Another anomalous effect occurs when someone is unlucky enough to actually see the boogeyman. Roughly two weeks after observing the creature, the person who saw it will begin experiencing various detrimental mental effects, including hallucinations and panic attacks. Some will also begin to experience physical issues, most often damage to the cardiovascular system. It is unknown why exactly these mental and physical effects occur, but it is theorized that SCP-015-IT may use it as a way to weaken certain prey that it considers too strong or potentially dangerous. In 2011, the Boogeyman was actually contained, but not by the SCP Foundation. The Brotherhood of St. George's Knights is a secret order in the Catholic Church that was created by the Pope in the year 453 to either contain or eliminate all anomalies, and it was this group that first captured SCP-015-IT, which they designated as DIA-212 in line with their own classification system. While it was in their containment, they made a number of discoveries about the creature that they labeled as a shadow demon. First, they found that while it feeds on the fear of its victims by ingesting their blood, it doesn't actually require this to survive. DIA-212, as they call it, is an unstable entity, and feeding allows it to maintain its physical shape in our reality. In addition to its impressive physical strength, the Boogeyman is also quite intelligent, as seen by its ability to successfully hunt, attack, and escape from humans. Strangely, it also appears to be resistant to weapons which have been blessed, causing only a fraction of the physical damage that they should when compared to a similar, non-holy version. During the course of research into the creature, Father Ilardi, a member of the Brotherhood of St. George's Knights, wrote that despite the creature being repugnant beyond every limit, he believed that it had a gentle soul and that its screams are similar to a pained cry. He postulated that SCP-015-IT may have even once been a human before some dark force transformed it into the monster that it had become. He decided that it was his mission to find a way to communicate with the creature, and one day bring it back into the light and love of his god. Father Alardi was making good progress with the creature, and it seemed like it was even growing fond of him and his disciples. But his advances were halted when they were attacked by a group of soldiers from the Fascist Council of the Occult, a terrorist group that seeks to use anomalies as weapons in their quest to disrupt the social order. In the attack, several of the Brotherhood were killed, and in the commotion, SCP-015-IT escaped. Following this, reports soon began to come from the province of Caserta that described what sounded like vampire attacks. A mobile task force was sent to the area, and while 015-IT was initially able to make use of its various physical abilities to evade and escape capture, it was eventually shot with a transmitter that allowed it to be tracked. The Italian mobile task force was able to surround the creature, but fearing being contained again, it responded with a level of violence that it had not been thought capable of. Several members of the task force were killed in the line of duty before the boogeyman could finally be subdued. Today, SCP-015-IT is contained at Site Vittoria in the Emilia-Romagna region of Italy. Since this anomaly is both sentient and highly unpredictable in its behavior, it has been classified as Euclid. It is kept in a standard humanoid entity containment cell and is monitored by video cameras and infrared sensors at all times. Due to the light-absorbing properties of its skin, its cell and the adjacent corridors are painted white and are to be kept well lit at all times. 
Twice a day, SCP-015-IT is given a normal domestic pig that it is allowed to feed on. Any personnel assigned to 015-IT duty must undergo a psychological assessment on a weekly basis and, regardless of the results, must be cycled out after three months of exposure to the boogeyman. You can never win a fight in Minnie Mouse ears. The girlfriend learns that lesson the hard way in the car driving through Florida. No matter how articulate you are, how many one-liners your brain throws together on the spot, or even how right you are, if you are wearing Minnie Mouse ears, you just won't win the argument. You said it was all booked, she yells, throwing her arms in the air and sending drops of iced caramel latte all over the inside of the rental car. He snatches the drink out of her hand and plants it firmly in the cup holder. He yells back at her that it wasn't his fault. How was he supposed to know the payment was declined? You didn't even check for a confirmation email? She scowls and crosses her arms. Her boyfriend glances across at her and laughs. I just can't take you seriously in those, her boyfriend says, pointing at the Minnie Mouse ears. She punches the button to wind the window down, rips the ears off of her head, and is about to throw the big black ears out the window. Only, she can't do it. Looking at the little bow, she feels her bottom lip start to tremble. She deflates, feeling the fight go out of her. I'm sorry, she says. I just really wanted to go to Disney World. I know. The pair of them drive in silence for a moment. The fight wasn't really about Disney. None of their fights were ever about what was really wrong. They'd always pick stupid, superficial things and shout about those, but not say what was really going wrong deeper down. That said, not getting to go to Disney World isn't just a superficial thing to her. Growing up in Sleepy Eye, Minnesota, she was very much used to having to explain to people where she was from. Sleepy Eye, yes, that's its real name. It's near New Ulm, near Mankato, about two hours from Minneapolis. If you don't know where Minneapolis is, she can't help you. Anyway, this trip was her first real adventure. She'd never left Minnesota much before. The flight down to Florida had been her first time on an airplane. All to come to the happiest place on Earth. Only, they got to the front gates, and her boyfriend realized his payment had been declined. Do they have the money to buy two new tickets on the door? Of course not. They've blown it all on airfares, car rental, airport food, and a pair of Minnie Mouse ears. I'm sure there are plenty of great things to do in Florida, her boyfriend says, trying to sound optimistic. For free? He doesn't reply. They just drive on in silence. Without a ticket to go to Disney World, they have no choice but to spend what little cash they have left on a motel for the night. It takes them about an hour to get there. The girlfriend gets straight out of the car and into their room, slamming the door behind her. Her boyfriend will just have to take a walk for a bit. There are cockroaches in the sink and some questionable stains on the bed, walls, and every flat surface in the room. There is apparently a pool out the back, but she's heard the stories of alligators roaming around this state and is in no mood to roll that dice in a place like this. She opens YouTube on her phone and puts on a horror video to listen to in the background. That calms her down. She loves that kind of thing. After 20 minutes, there's a soft knock at the door. Looking apologetic as anything, her boyfriend nudges his way into the room, holding a brochure in his hand. She snatches it off him without a word, and reads it with as grumpy of an expression as possible. Spooky self-guided tours in Florida. Visit the infamously haunted Pensacola Lighthouse today to chill your bones in the Florida heat. Explore the scariest spot on the coast for free, with a special Disney twist. Okay, fine. Her boyfriend does know how to cheer her up, but she can't let him know that. He's still supposed to be in trouble. But the following night, as the pair of them approach the lighthouse in the pitch darkness, she can't help but crack a smile. With the light at the top turned off and the railing surrounding the building stabbing sharply into the air, the place certainly looks pretty haunted. The brochure tells them that the place is a maritime museum during the day, but is currently closed to the public for maintenance. However, there's a spare key to be found right under… Got it! Her boyfriend straightens up proudly and turns to hand her the key that he retrieved from under the flower pot. She scowls at him to make sure he still knows he's in trouble for not getting them into Disney, but she does secretly feel a little glimmer of affection. He's always been the first behind the couch during horror movies, so he's clearly trying his best to make it up to her. The creaking noise that she was really hoping for doesn't come when she opens the door. It opens smoothly. Her boyfriend flicks the light switch instinctively, and the inside of the museum immediately lights up showing glass cabinets, old nautical equipment, and a few flags. She groans and switches the lights back off. It's not exactly a haunted tour if you just turn all the lights on. But the magic of the room is gone now. 
They've now seen everything, nothing lurking in the dark, no shadows, just a boring old museum. They trudge into the next room. There's so much streetlight spilling through the window that they can see practically everything in here as well. It's a recreation of the old lighthouse keeper's bedroom. A couple of old-looking beds, antique wardrobes, and clothes from the olden days. So much for a haunted lighthouse. This is so lame, the girlfriend groans and switches the light on. Even her boyfriend isn't looking scared by any of this. There's literally nothing to be scared of in here, can we just go home? Her boyfriend looks apologetic again. He's really tried to salvage this vacation, but it just hasn't happened. She can't be too mad at him. You know what? No, she says. Let's at least finish looking around this museum, then we can go. We can just switch on the lights, read the exhibits, and see the view from on top of the lighthouse. So they do that. The pair of them go back into the first room and start reading through the signs under each of the displays. There's a diagram explaining all of the different knots that sailors used to tie. A long paragraph all about how the lighthouse used to burn oil but now runs on electricity generated by… The girlfriend yawns. Without the adrenaline of any ghosts, museums are much harder work in the middle of the night. It isn't even Disney-themed like the brochure promised. The only Disney thing in here is that Mickey Mouse mascot in the corner. It doesn't even fit with the rest of the museum, just a random costume on a mannequin. It must be almost seven feet tall. Her boyfriend is staring at it real close. He leans in, examining the material up close under the bright museum lights. This thing's weird, he says. I wonder how old it is. Look, the white's all faded, and it's got this fur effect. Crunch! Mickey Mouse chomps into her boyfriend's arm with a ferocious set of teeth. Neither of them reacts at all, frozen by total disbelief as Mickey stands there, his huge rat-like fangs embedded in the boyfriend's arm. He yanks it from the cartoon character's jaws, blood leaking from the wounds. How can this be happening? Mickey's eyes flick between the two of them. He raises a gloved hand and waves. The boyfriend shrieks, turns on his heels and runs, clattering into one of the exhibits as he goes. He crashes into her, and the wound on his arm hits her in the chest. She looks down, confused at the bloodstain on her shirt, then back at Mickey Mouse. He gives a little shooing motion with his hands. Run. Now it's her turn to scream. She grabs her boyfriend and bundles him out of the room. Mickey was standing right by the entrance. They're gonna have to hope there's another way out somewhere deeper in the museum. They run through room after room, every few steps turning to see Mickey following them. He isn't running at all, he's sauntering along, arms swinging cartoonishly around. Just like in Steamboat Willie, he's whistling a tune to himself as he goes. That must be the door out of here. The pair of them crash into it and go tumbling into the next room. There's blood everywhere. Her boyfriend is looking more and more pale by the second. They're not outside, though. They're in a small circular room with a spiral staircase running up, up, up into darkness. Mickey's whistling is getting louder. They don't have a choice here. The girlfriend jumps up and hauls her tiring boyfriend to his feet. Putting his unwounded arm over her shoulder, she half carries him up the stairs, feeling the metal spiral shudder under them with every step. Halfway up, she looks back over her shoulder. Mickey is standing in the doorway. He waves enthusiastically. Her legs are burning by the time she reaches the top of the lighthouse. Barging open the door, she throws her boyfriend rather unceremoniously up onto the balcony around the big light. Panting, she turns back around to look back down into the darkness below them. Mickey is standing by a big switch on the wall. He laughs and flips the switch. A big clunking sound comes from the light next to her. Very slowly at first, it starts to spin. The light flickers on dimly, dimly at first, then gets brighter. Faster and faster it spins, brighter and brighter the beam until it's blinding. She raises an arm to shield herself from the piercing light. Against the dark of the night, her eyes can't adjust between light and dark fast enough. She's going blind up here. From below, she hears a heavy footstep on metal, then another. The whistling starts again, as Mickey cheerfully makes his way up to them. She glances down at him. He waves happily up at her again. She almost waves back instinctively. No, now's not the time. She needs to come up with a plan. But her brain just can't do it. For all the horror movies she's watched, all the times where she's screaming at the TV telling the protagonist what to do, now that she's in one for herself, she's got nothing. But wait, maybe she does have something. A pair of gloved hands appear on the doorframe, gripping the wood tightly. A smiling Mickey Mouse pops his head around the door, blood all over his chin. He just stays there for a moment, eyes flitting between her and her boyfriend, bleeding out on the floor. <laughs> he sticks a comically large shoe out from the doorway and steps out onto the gallery to join them. The light swings around and shines in his face. As soon as it hits him, he bares his teeth, thousands of them, and shrieks in their faces. That's it. 
The girlfriend runs at him fast as she can. At the last moment, she jumps, bends her legs, and with all the force she can muster, two foot kicks him in the chest. The giant mascot is really solid. He's so heavy that all of her efforts only just about knocks him off balance. But it's enough. Tripping over his own giant shoes, Mickey falls backwards. His back hits the railing, and for a second, it looks like he's going to be okay. But his momentum is just too much. His feet fly up into the air as he tips back over it, tumbling down into the darkness and laughing all the way down. Crunch! Mickey lands, impaled on the spiked railings outside the lighthouse. One of the rails stabs straight through his head. His smile freezes in place. His laughter stops. Her boyfriend is not looking okay. He's barely conscious now, lying in a sickeningly large pool of blood. They need to get him to a hospital fast. Still not recovered from carrying him up the lighthouse stairs, she now has to haul him back down them. The pair leave a red trail all the way through the museum, but that's the last of her concerns at this point. Not looking across at Mickey lying dead on the railing, the girlfriend dumps her boyfriend into the passenger seat of the rental car and goes round to the driver's side. She doesn't have a license, but she did a few lessons this year. Should be fine, the roads will be empty. All she needs to do is get them to a hospital. Her boyfriend is groaning in the passenger seat. She starts fishing through his pockets for the keys. She glances up at the mirror. Mickey is still lying on the fence, motionless. The door to the museum is closed, just like how they left it. Or wait, did they leave it open? She tries the other pocket. Her boyfriend is trying to say something. She shushes him. He can tell her later, but he keeps trying. Raising his uninjured arm, he points at something on the dashboard. Her mouse ears, what's the big deal? They've already dealt with Mickey Mouse. No, wait, not Mickey. Mini. Bang! Two large dents appear on the car's roof right above their heads. The girlfriend desperately turns back to her boyfriend, searching pocket after pocket for these keys. Why does he have so many damn pockets on these shorts? She glances out the window and stops dead still, peering through the glass at her, head upside down as she leans over from the roof. Minnie Mouse waves at her. The gloved hand stops moving and points at the third pocket down on the left. The girlfriend reaches into it and finds the keys. Minnie gives a big double thumbs up, tilts her head back, and slams it into the glass. Bang! Bang! Again and again, she pounds her forehead on the windshield. The glass sags and fractures into smaller and smaller pieces. The girlfriend doesn't have time to sit and wait, though. She stabs the keys into the car and starts the engine. Slamming the accelerator to the floor, the car shoots off into the night. Minnie gives her another double thumbs up, winds a hand back, and punches it through the window. The girlfriend screams. The hand grabs the top of her boyfriend's head and starts to slowly twist it around. No matter how much she swerves the car, the girlfriend can't knock the mouse off the roof. Round and round her boyfriend's head goes. Crunch! His vertebrae detached and grate against each other. His head is looking all the way backwards at his seat, but Minnie keeps turning it, round and round, until he's looking straight forwards again, neck crumpled and splitting, eyes lifeless. Minnie puts a hand to her mouth and giggles. Oops! The road disappears from under the car, and it free falls for a second, the nose tipping forward. Crash! The nose lands first, tipping the car forwards and throwing the girlfriend through what remains of the windscreen. She tumbles across the sand, feeling her arms snapping underneath her as she goes. In a blur, she tries to get to her feet, but collapses. Rolling onto her back, she stares up at the stars as the sea laps against her cheek. A pair of giant round ears with a little pink bow block her view. Minnie peers down at her, spotting the girl's broken arm. With two giant gloved hands, she reaches down and takes the arm in her grip, breaking it back the other way and shoving it together until it resembles how it used to look. Minnie gives her the double thumbs up. The girlfriend doesn't even try to move. This is it. She's accepted her fate. But Minnie looks sad. Putting her hands under the girlfriend's armpits, she lifts her up and puts her back on her feet. She makes that same shooting motion Mickey did before. The girlfriend stumbles back a couple of paces, but falls over again. Exasperated, Minnie throws her hands in the air, picks the girlfriend up again, and puts her back on her feet. Minnie points at her. You. She then makes a little running motion with her fingers and points off up the beach. You run. Just kill me, the girlfriend says, exhaustion racking her every word. Minnie puts her head in her hands, even more exasperated than before. The mouse puts her hands together and makes a begging motion. Please? The girlfriend just stands there, 
Minnie throws her arms in the air, looks down at the girl, and shrieks, baring all her teeth. She stays put. Minnie pushes her over, jumps down into a straddling position, and punches the girlfriend in the head with her gloved hand. Pain fills the girl's head, shooting the fear back into her. With nothing left, the girl pushes herself free and stumbles away from Minnie. She hobbles up the beach, blood flowing freely down either side of her head. She's going as fast as she can, but it's barely faster than a walk. Behind her, Minnie is covering her eyes and counting on an outstretched hand, playing hide and seek. There's nowhere for her to go though, nowhere to hide. They're just on an open beach, stretching out in front of her and behind her. Nowhere to go except… She splashes out into the sea, up to her knees, her waist, her chest. Now she's just fully swimming. Her broken arm screams at her from the motion. She barely has the strength to kick. Salt water splashes up into her ear holes and feels like it's washing straight into her brain. The world sounds strange and choked. The girl cranes her neck around to see Minnie standing on the shore. The mouse waves at her enthusiastically. The girl waves back. Minnie giggles. The two of them stay like that for almost an hour, the girl steadily dying in the sea, trying to stay afloat, Minnie waiting enthusiastically on the shore. With each wave, the girl is slowly brought closer and closer to the mouse, until she's lying helplessly at the creature's giant feet. The last thing she sees is a pair of giant, round ears. Turns out she had been wrong. You can absolutely win a fight with a pair of Minnie Mouse ears. Next time you're considering going on vacation in the state of Florida, it would be wise of you to avoid reading any brochures you may come across just in case you come across SCP-3640, a seemingly harmless brochure. SCP-3640 can be found all across the state, though it is currently unknown how they come into being. These brochures will promote self-guided tours within the state, all of areas that have particular ghost stories, folklore, or rumors of hauntings attached to them. These tours are free and promise tourists an up-close and personal look at the haunted history of Florida. However, most are not prepared for just how up-close these tours end up being. If you read this brochure and decide to go along to the location advertised at the time it lists, you will be met with instances of SCP-3640-Alpha. In this case, these creatures manifested themselves as Mickey and Minnie Mouse, however, they can take the form of any uniformed mascots associated with the Walt Disney Media conglomerate. These mascots will hunt you down mercilessly, but with all the charm and squeaky clean joy we all know and love. Live ammunition does little to stop these SCPs when directed at the body, but a clean headshot has been proven to do the trick. It is fortunate then for our tourist couple that Mickey's head was impaled on the railing. What is less fortunate, however, is that they were there together. This is because SCP-3640 has a few interesting rules for how it operates. In order for SCP-3640-Alpha instances to engage in the hunt, every member of the party has to have read the brochure. If a group of five go to a haunted house at the designated time, but only four of them have read the brochure, they will enjoy a nice, spooky, but safe evening. If all members of the party have read the brochure, however, the same number of mascots will manifest and hunt them down. For a group of 20 college students, you can only imagine the colorful range of Disney characters that come out to play. These SCPs will also only remain within their state borders. If you find yourself being hunted down, you can either run for the border or find a good place to hide until the times allotted for your self-guided tour come to an end. It remains unclear how these SCPs grow, reproduce, or where they go outside of their hunting times, if they continue to exist at all. Who knows, there are a lot of back rooms in Disney World with all mascot costumes lying around. The Walt Disney Company is under continuous surveillance to ascertain any link between SCP-3640 and the brand themselves. To this day, a letter from the company to a local governor in 1979 is the only tie to have been found between them and the creatures. It reads, Dear Governor Askew, the Walt Disney Company thanks you for your cooperation in this matter regarding the unlicensed Walt Disney character operators. Please pass along the following information collected by the outstanding men and women of the City of Orlando's Police Department to the Florida National Guard. If a character is spotted, call to get its attention and then rapidly flash your flashlights at the costume. If it does not flinch, fire on sight, aim at the head if possible, else aim at the knees to disable them and then finish them off with headshots. Body shots have been known to lack effectiveness deceased characters are to be incinerated, no other means of disposal are advised. We are currently pursuing alternative legal means of shutting down these unlicensed operators and hope to achieve a settlement within the end of the year. Cordially yours, 
the Walt Disney Company. A gigantic monster stomps across the land, with nothing able to stop its rampage except for, come and eat, cries out a voice, and the monster suddenly stops and falls to the side. The child picks up his toy and runs back to where his mother and father have spread out a picnic lunch. As they eat, the boy asks his father about the nearby buildings, a series of six identical structures, each of which is a small rectangular building with a satellite dish on top of it. The weathered buildings look like they have been out here for some time, and the father tells the boy that he isn't sure exactly what they are or what their purpose is, but that they were probably built during the war. What war? The young boy asks. The Pacific War, his father answers. What was that? It was a war fought by many countries of the world. Why did they fight? The boy asks. Well, there were a lot of reasons. What were some of the reasons? The father has played this game many times before, and he knows if he doesn't end this line of questioning now, that he'll never be able to eat his lunch. The mother, sensing the same, tells the boy that if he wants to, he can go and play with his toy some more. The boy doesn't need to be given the option again. He quickly gets up and grabs his toy monster before running off to play. Don't go too far, his mother calls out as she watches her son head in the direction of one of the buildings. The boy stops in the shadow of one of the large satellite dishes and sits down in the grass to resume his monster's path of destruction across the countryside. As the monster moves through the tall grass, though, the shadow he is sitting in suddenly starts to shift. The boy looks up to see that the satellite dish on top of the building is moving. With a groan, it begins to turn and change its angle. And it isn't just the one on the building closest to him that's moving. He can see that each of the six satellite dishes are doing the same thing. They're all turning to point towards the same spot on the horizon. The boy squints in the sunlight and sees what they're all now directed towards. Off, far in the distance, is a real monster. It's a massive looking creature, a huge half fish, half lizard, covered in scales and spiky fins. It must be at least 50 meters tall or more, and it's coming straight towards him. The boy can already hear the sounds of its giant webbed feet stomping and shaking the ground. And as it gets closer, its high-pitched shrieks and cries become audible too. Adding to the cacophony, an air raid siren begins to wail, followed by the sounds of gunfire, the marching of hundreds of boots, and the roar of engines. The boy looks around, but he doesn't see any of it. It's just him, the buildings, and the monster. The boy can't run, though. He's frozen in fear. All he can do is watch as it swipes at trees and power lines, knocking them down with ease, all while getting closer and closer. The satellite dishes finally finish their slow alignment, and there's a loud humming noise, followed by a loud cracking sound, as each one emits a bright beam of electricity at the monster. The creature stops its assault and howls in pain as the six satellites focus their beams on it. The beams disappear, and the monster appears stunned, but then it looks up and continues to come forward, this time even faster than before. The monster is only hundreds of feet away now, and the boy doesn't know what to do. He's too scared to even scream for help. He closes his eyes and starts to cry when he's abruptly lifted into the air. The boy opens his eyes to see that it's his father. He picks up the boy and starts to run as fast as he can. The boy can see over his father's shoulder that the monster has not changed its course to follow them. It seems to still be focused on the building he was playing next to. The monster finally reaches the building and begins swiping at it, tearing it apart as the other satellites slowly realign, all pointing at the creature once again. The sound of the invisible army increases, and the monster reels as if it is struck by unseen weapons. It suddenly rears back in pain as an artillery shell appears just feet away from it before exploding in the creature's face. But nothing seems able to deter it, and it keeps clawing at the building with the satellite dish. The father finally reaches the mother, who grabs the boy and embraces him tightly. There is a loud noise, and the family turns to watch as the monster finishes destroying the building and turns its attention to one of the others. But then the dishes unleash another blast of electricity at it with a thunderous crack. The creature howls in pain as it stumbles and falls to its knees. It is struggling to get back up when yet another blast hits it and it falls to the ground. It breathes a couple of final, labored breaths before it closes its eyes, its enormous tongue lolling out of its mouth. The creature is finally dead. A loud celebratory cheer goes up in the empty field from what sounds like hundreds of people as the creature begins to slowly fade from view before eventually disappearing completely. Meanwhile, all the family can do is stare in amazement at the bizarre scene they have just witnessed. The extremely strange events that just befell this average family may sound like the plot of a movie, and in some ways, it was, because this is SCP-2954, also known as Looping Kaiju Killing. SCP-2954 is an anomaly that consists of several distinct components. 
The first, SCP-2954-1A, are the six large structures that resemble buildings with satellite dishes, which are located near a now-deserted rural town in Japan. The word resemble is very important, because these are not actual satellite dishes, but instead appear to be nothing more than facsimiles of real ones. The interior of the SCP-2954-1A buildings lack all of the mechanical components one would expect to find inside, and instead contain only a crude rope and pulley system which control the satellite dishes on the building's roof. Despite their lack of internal machinery, the satellite dishes are nonetheless somehow capable of discharging powerful electric arcs of energy, which they only do when confronted by an SCP-2954-2 instance. SCP-2954-2 refers to creatures which have a mix of reptilian, amphibious, and fish-like traits. They are always 50 to 60 meters in height, and most of their body is smooth and blue-gray in color, except for their scaled underbellies, which are red. Both their back and forearms have large spiny fins, and SCP-2954-2 instances walk upright on two legs, though they are always hunchback. Their mouths are also always agape and are capable of spitting a highly corrosive acid. These creatures appear during a period of time that have been designated as Subaraya events. These events, which start every seven days, consist of a single instance of SCP-2954-2 manifesting near the SCP-2954-1A buildings before it begins destroying its surroundings. The buildings will then activate, turning their attention on the creature and firing their electric arcs at it in an attempt to stop its rampage. This will cause SCP-2954-2 to focus its attention on one of the buildings, which it will then try to destroy. As it does so, the sounds of weapons being fired, vehicles moving, and orders being shouted in Japanese can be heard. This phantom army, which has been designated as SCP-2954-1B, is only heard, not seen, and there are never any physical signs of their fight, save for the creature's own reactions to the weapons and the occasional artillery shell that will materialize in midair before striking it. During these Tsuburaya events, the SCP-2954-2 instance will always destroy at least one of the satellite dish buildings, and various other explosions roughly equivalent to what would be expected from small vehicles being destroyed will also be seen as it fights back against the 2954-1B army. Eventually, the combined assault of the 1A and 1B forces will be enough to overwhelm the creature, and it will collapse, grow transparent, and eventually disappear completely. A disembodied cheer will be heard, presumably from the 1B army, and any damage to the environment, including the 1A buildings, will be reversed. But what is the cause of this endless cycle of destruction and restoration? Where do the creatures come from, and what do they want? And who is the invisible army that always stands ready to fight back against the rampaging monsters? The answers to those questions may have been discovered while exploring the area where the Tsuburaya events take place. There, in another small abandoned building, SCP Foundation agents discovered a trove of objects that may shed some light on just what these creatures are. The objects located included various movie posters, film reels, and documents that appear to be related to the production and distribution of motion pictures. The posters seem to depict creatures quite similar to the SCP-2954-2 instances, and the title of the poster when translated from Japanese reads, Fukairu's Assault. When agents viewed the footage on the film reels, they found that it depicted a scenario quite similar to the Tsuburaya events. Also of interest are a series of notes found within a filing cabinet inside of the building, with several being of particular note. The first, when translated from Japanese, reads, Our sponsor gave 20 monsters to shoot. We'll pick the best footage. The second, which is dated to 1974, says, Filming completed. Don't forget, call our sponsor to say further shipments are unneeded. The third and fourth are both addressed to what may be the film's producers, and they read, Do you need more Fukairu? We can resupply until you're satisfied. And, you have not replied for a while. Regardless, we will send another shipment. Happy filming. But perhaps strangest of all is that there are multiple similar versions of the last note, and while the oldest is dated to 1972, additional instances continue to appear to this day, with new letters sporadically manifesting inside of the filing cabinet. The obvious danger that is caused by a rampaging 50-meter-tall monster is clear, and this anomaly has been classified Euclid as a result. Though since the creature is inevitably always killed by the SCP-2954-1 forces, containment is instead focused on keeping the public away from the area. Guards have been stationed around the area to prevent civilians from entering during Tsuburaya events, and any members of the public who do manage to witness an event are to be administered Class A amnestics. What is the origin of these looping kaiju? Did someone attempt to harness an anomalous source in order to produce special effects for their film? 
If so, were they killed by their own creation before being able to turn it off, leading to a never-ending cycle of attacks? While we may never know the answer for sure, at least the result is entertaining. Provided you keep your distance, that is. The full moon hangs heavy in the night sky over the dense jungle canopy. Below, the darkened palm trees stand silent in the humid air, festooned with vines and lianas, and tropical insects hum in the undergrowth. The night is quiet and dark here, far from the city, in one of the farthest, most secluded provinces of the Philippines. One would hardly expect anyone to be out at this time of night. The young woman is hurrying home, carrying a lantern before her face so that she can see where she's going in the pitch black of the night. Her swollen belly reveals that she's at least several months pregnant, her new middle throwing her off balance just enough that she has to be careful not to stumble. A woman in her condition, she thinks, shouldn't be out at this time of night and certainly shouldn't have to do household chores like this. But the work has to get done, no matter what. She carries a basket of wet laundry under her other arm. She is returning from washing her clothes in the river and, if she had planned things out better, she would have been home long before the moon rose. Unfortunately, she spent far too much time gossiping with several other village women before getting to work on scrubbing her filthy clothes against the rocks. Luckily, it's not too far from the river back to her home in the village. The worst thing that might happen, she reminds herself, is that she might lose her footing in the dark and trip over a rock or a root. There's no chance that she might run afoul of some nocturnal animal, she tells herself, even though the sudden chills down her spine and sweat dripping from her brow reveals the truth, that she doesn't believe that at all, and, in fact, she's getting more and more nervous as she staggers through the dark. It isn't just the threat of wild animals. She remembers the stories that her mother told her when she was a little girl, all about sinister supernatural monsters that live in these woods. Of course, those are just stories invented to scare children, she tells herself. She's a grown woman now, about to have a child of her own. She shouldn't be worried about boogeymen. She just needs to keep her head on her shoulders, and she'll be sure to arrive home safely. The lantern throws its light over a figure standing below the crook of a catmon tree. The woman jolts, nearly dropping her laundry. She gulps back a scream as she realizes that what she sees isn't a wild animal, but rather, a person. Oh, sorry, says the young woman, her voice shaking a little. I didn't think anyone else was still out this late. I thought you were a wild animal. Don't you worry, little one, says the figure in a soft, sibilant voice. The figure steps forward, and the young woman recognizes her. It's an old woman from the village, her back hunched, and her long white hair falling over her shoulders in a messy tangle. The young woman feels inexplicably nervous running into this particular villager here in the jungle at night. Many of the village kids whisper that she's actually a witch who has all kinds of weird supernatural powers. Even some of the village elders are afraid to cross her for fear of getting cursed. Where are you going at this hour? Someone in your condition shouldn't exert yourself so much. I'm just heading home, says the young woman, hefting the basket of laundry for emphasis. It's dangerous to be out so late alone. Here, let me walk home with you. There's safety in numbers, you know. Th thank you. The young woman almost wants to protest that she doesn't need any help getting home because she really does not want to spend any more time with this old woman. But at the same time, she is reluctant to say anything that might insult her. After all, even if the young woman doesn't believe in witchcraft, it's not like she wants to take any chances. Besides, the truth is that she is rather frightened of being alone in the dark, and any company is better than nothing, even if it's this strange old woman. How far along are you, honey? says the old woman, placing a hand against the surface of the young woman's protruding belly. The young woman grimaces. She doesn't like this old woman intruding on her personal space like this. The old woman's hands are wrinkled and veiny, flecked with liver spots, and her fingers topped with gnarled talons. The young woman wants to cry out at the sight of them, but she bites her tongue. Instead, she answers the old woman's probing question as calmly and politely as she can. Very nice, very nice says the old woman, her roomy eyes never straying from the young woman's belly, and her hands still rubbing against her stomach as if she's trying to reach something within. The old woman makes a strange sound in her throat, like she's smacking her lips in hunger, but it's hard to see anything in the dark. The young woman can only nod in confusion, but she quickens her pace. She hopes that she can get home soon, and once she's home, she can get away from her unfortunate travel companion. The old woman keeps pace, grabbing her younger traveling companion by the arm and holding tight. Her grip is surprisingly firm for such a seemingly frail old woman, and the young woman again wonders if maybe there's something supernatural about this ominous crone. 
She wants to pull her arm away, but the old woman's long claws pinch cruelly into her flesh. It's as if the old woman is silently warning her, don't pull away. I'm too strong for you to escape. What a sweet little bundle of joy you carry there, says the old woman, as if speaking to herself. What a delectable little burden. The young woman knows that she's still talking about her unborn baby, but all this mumbling just makes her more worried. They continue walking, the young woman staring resolutely at the small circle of illumination thrown by her lantern onto the path ahead, doing everything in her power to not look at the old woman standing at her side for fear that she might scream. Why is she so nervous? Worse, does the old woman sense her fear? The young woman has heard that witches are easily offended, and that's the last thing that she needs now. She continues walking, the old woman gibbering and whispering in her ear, plying her with odd questions about her pregnancy. Eating well, have you? You know, it's very important to eat right when you're carrying, so that the baby can be born strong and healthy. Right, says the young woman. She really doesn't need this unsolicited advice. She heaves an audible sigh of relief as the village comes into view over the next bluff. Thank God, she thinks, I'm almost home. She just hopes that the old woman will take a hint and leave her alone once they arrive at her doorstep. She wonders if this old woman might try to come into her home or maybe steer her towards some other destination. But what can she do? All she can do is keep walking home and hope for the best. Is it just you, is it? Is the father in the picture, hmm? I haven't seen you with any young men lately, have I? Asks the old woman. Her nosiness is really starting to irritate the young woman, enough that she almost forgets her fear. No, it's just me, says the young woman automatically. She immediately regrets that confession. What is this old woman planning? Is she up to some mischief? Now she knows that the young woman lives alone, and there won't be anyone around to see whatever this crone is planning. Her grip tightens on the young woman's arm as if to warn her again. The village is quiet and dark. Everyone else has already gone to bed by now, so the pair of them walk down narrow, still streets. The only sound is the crunch, crunch, crunch of gravel under their feet. After what seems like an eternity, they arrive at the front gate of the young woman's house. Well, here I am, she says, a little too loudly and firmly to be completely casual. This is my home. Thanks for keeping me company on my way home. To her immense relief, the old woman lets go of her arm. The young woman immediately pulls away, rubbing the deep bruises left by the old woman's gnarled talons. Think nothing of it, my dear. The old woman smiles widely, a long rope of saliva dribbling from her slack lips. Her teeth look jagged and misshapen. It's hard to see in the dark, but they look more like the teeth of a wild beast than a human. It must be your eyes playing tricks on her in the dim light, though. The young woman can't help but recoil in disgust, but luckily her face is hidden in shadows, so the old woman doesn't seem to notice. I'm happy to help. I hope to see you again very soon. The young woman doesn't wait any longer. Even before the old woman turns to leave, the young woman scampers across her yard and yanks open her door. She runs inside and pulls the door shut behind her. Her heart is racing, and her breath comes in ragged pants. She can feel the baby in her belly kick, suddenly agitated by its mother's fear. Shh, it's okay, she coos softly, patting her stomach and hoping that her tender voice will help to calm her baby. I know you're scared. I'm scared too. That old woman frightened me half to death. They say that she's a witch and I'd almost believe it. What a strange experience. She pulls the curtain aside and peeps out the window. The old woman is gone. The young woman looks up and down the street, but sees no sign of her traveling companion. She inhales deeply and feels the tension drain from her body as she lets her breath out. Thank goodness that's all over. She can't explain why this whole night has unnerved her so much, but there was just something so uncanny about that strange old woman. She's glad to be rid of her. The young woman tries to put the whole experience out of her head as she prepares for bed. As she pulls on her nightclothes, she startles when she hears something heavy and loud clatter across the roof. It's not unusual for roof rats or other nocturnal animals to scurry across the roof at night, but this sounds louder than usual. It's probably nothing, she tells herself as she climbs into bed. I'm still just upset about meeting that old woman on my way home from the river. That whole thing must have jangled my nerves worse than I thought if I'm flinching at every little sound. I'll be fine when it's light out. The sooner I get to sleep, the sooner it'll be morning. Even though her nerves are rattled, she is quite tired after a long day, and it doesn't take long before she drifts off to sleep. The young woman's eyes close, and her breathing becomes slow and steady, the shallow rhythms of sleep. Inside her head, she might be troubled by strange dreams, but to any outside observer, 
she is dead to the world. Asleep in bed, she doesn't react to the clattering on the roof. Whatever is up there is making an awful racket as it drags itself over the roof tiles. If someone were around to watch, they would see that whatever is on the roof is no rat. It's a darkened figure, almost big enough to be human, but strangely truncated. Two massive leathery wings unfurl behind it, extended to help the strange creature maintain its balance upon the roof. It drags itself forward using only its hands, long talons tapping at the roof shingles as it seeks a loose tile, anything that will give it access to the house below. Its finger finds a crack. Wheezing and panting, the creature leans forward, putting its eye to the crack to peer into the room below. The young woman is asleep in bed directly below, and that's exactly what this creature was hoping for. The young woman mumbles in her sleep, her mind filled with disturbing dreams. She's oblivious when, all of a sudden, something drops through that crack in the ceiling. It's long and slippery and covered in thick, wet mucus. It looks, for all the world, like a tongue, but it's far too long to be any human tongue. It drops lower and lower into the room, extending closer and closer to the young woman sleeping in her bed. The disgusting appendage caresses her face, leaving a wet slug trail of saliva across her forehead as if it's looking for something, then brushes against her lips, and the tongue seems to find what it wants. Instantly, it snakes into her open mouth and shoots down her throat. The young woman starts to sputter and choke, her limbs thrashing and flailing, but still, she is held fast in the grip of sleep. Some wild nightmare is playing out in her head. Perhaps she fantasizes that she is drowning in a river or choking on some food or being strangled by a fiend. Whatever she's thinking, it couldn't be further from the truth that an alien tongue has jammed itself down her throat. The tongue pushes deeper and deeper inside her until it makes contact with her womb. A trained anatomist might balk at the idea that the tongue could find her womb by accessing her throat, but somehow it has done exactly this, snaking its way through the labyrinth of her insides to find her unborn baby. A sticky aperture opens up at the tip of the tongue, revealing that the tongue is hollow, like a massive soda straw. It sucks up the baby like a vacuum, slurping it up, 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 and out, the bulge of its prey traveling up the length of the tongue like a wild pig swallowed by a boa constrictor. Once the baby is gone, the tongue slides out of the woman's mouth and retracts back toward the ceiling, disappearing back through the subtle crack. There's a clatter on the roof again, followed by the soft flutter of leathery wings. The young woman settles back into a deep, still sleep, the awful sensation of suffocation having passed. The rest of the night is peaceful and quiet, but when she awakens the next morning, she finds that the nightmare isn't over. She wakes with a strange, empty feeling in her guts. Something is very wrong. She throws aside her covers and stares at herself in shock. Her baby is gone. Her rounded belly has deflated back to its pre-pregnancy state, and she can sense, as only a mother can, that she is no longer carrying something within her. She shrieks in terror at this bizarre revelation. What could have happened? What could be responsible? That young woman just had an encounter with SCP-5201. SCP-5201 is a humanoid subspecies native to the Philippines, dubbed Homo sapiens visceralis, but known by many local names across the Philippine Islands, including the Oswang, the Tik Tik, or simply the Viscera Sucker. But it is most commonly known as the Mananangal. During the day, an instance of SCP-5201 looks like an ordinary human, at a glance, there is no way to immediately distinguish an instance of SCP-5201 from a regular member of Homo sapiens. However, Foundation researchers have found that there do exist certain retinal irregularities unique to SCP-5201, so the agency has developed a portable retinal scanner for use in quickly identifying instances of SCP-5201. SCP-5201 is far easier to tell from an ordinary human at night when it undergoes a strange and startling metamorphosis. It unfolds a pair of membranous wings, resembling those of a bat, from its back. Even more startling, its torso splits in two. Its upper torso then flies off in search of prey, while its lower torso is hidden in a secure location until SCP-5201 can reconnect. SCP-5201 will seek out human prey, most likely relying on a keenly attuned sense of smell, and, once it has chosen a victim, will alight on the roof of their home and then snake its preternaturally long, tube-like tongue into the house below so that it can feed. SCP-5201 feeds by inserting its tongue into the orifices of unfortunate sleepers and sucking out their internal organs as easily as you would suck soda through a straw. SCP-5201 will happily eat human livers, stomachs, and intestines, but its favorite food is unborn fetuses. 
so much so that instances of SCP-5201 disguised in their human form can often be recognized by their tendency to drool at the sight of pregnant women. SCP-5201 are well known to local humans who live in fear of nocturnal attacks by the dreaded Mananangal. Interestingly, SCP-5201 can be repelled by Abrahamic holy objects like rosary beads or crucifixes, or can be staked through the heart with sharpened shafts of bamboo, very similar to the means used against vampires in Western folklore. SCP-5201 is especially vulnerable when its upper torso is out hunting, so it will always take the utmost care to hide its abandoned lower torso in a secret, secure location. If you can find the hidden lower torso, it is possible to kill SCP-5201 by sprinkling its exposed viscera with spices like garlic, salt, or vinegar, or failing that, even ash or urine. This causes an unusual reaction that is not yet fully understood by Foundation researchers, but will prevent the two halves from rejoining. If the two halves of the Mananangal cannot rejoin before dawn, sunlight will kill the creature. If none of these methods are available, it is also possible to repel SCP-5201 by using a specialized whip fashioned from the tail of a stingray. The SCP Foundation currently has an undisclosed number of domesticated SCP-5201 instances held in the fauna containment wing of Site-235. Because this species has been known to practice cannibalism, each specimen is to be held in its own personal containment cell. While there are obvious ethical and logistical concerns with feeding human organs to SCP-5201, the Foundation has discovered that SCP-5201 can still easily thrive on a diet of any newborn mammal with a mass of at least one kilogram. Piglets have so far proven to be the most cost-effective and available options, but other species can be substituted as necessary. All entrances to SCP-5201 containment cells are to be guarded by at least two Level 2 personnel equipped with stingray whips, crucifixes, or some other object found to cause harm to SCP-5201. Unlike humans, SCP-5201 have an unusual asexual reproductive process. The lower body can regenerate a new upper torso via a process similar to epimorphic regeneration observed in autonomous lizards. Upper torso of an SCP-5201 would leave behind the parent's lower torso to search for a compatible female human. SCP-5201 would attack and consume this human, claiming her lower torso as its own smearing ash, urine, or spices into the exposed innards of the lower torso inhibits this process and prevents effective reproduction. The exact origin of SCP-5201 is unknown. Although the creature is endemic throughout the Philippines, and historical records indicate that it has inhabited the island since at least 1500, when it was first described by Spanish sailors to the islands, fossil remains and genetic testing indicate that it is actually an invasive species from outside the Philippine archipelago. SCP-5201 is currently believed to be extinct in the wild, following eradication efforts by the Foundation in the 1990s. An epidemic of SCP-5201 attacks in the early 90s prompted the SCP Foundation to join forces with the Supernatural Committee of the Philippines and the Global Occult Coalition to take action to prevent SCP-5201 from spreading to other countries. Dubbed Project Dipsy, the operation involved amnesticizing the major cities of the Philippines, funding propaganda campaigns to dismiss SCP-5201 as a product of folklore and urban legends, and eventually domesticating the surviving SCP-5201 population for cellular regeneration research. Because of its aggressiveness and taste for human flesh, SCP-5201 specimens regularly attempt to breach containment and thus have been given the designation Euclid. And while the SCP Foundation has done its best to eliminate the threat of SCP-5201 in the wild, there's no guarantee that a few instances of this vicious monster might have slipped through the cracks and possibly even spread out into the wider world beyond its home in the Philippines. You still might want to search your room for any suspicious cracks or holes before you bed down for the night, because there are very few things less pleasant than waking up from restless dreams to find a long, slimy tongue jammed down your throat. The early morning sun rises casting its radiance over the field. The shepherd stands guard, watching his sheep graze. It's a beautiful morning, the sheep are quiet, and his loyal dog is at his side. But the shepherd is perturbed. He is certain that there are sheep missing. He wanders through the field, counting the sheep off one by one, but no matter how many times he counts, he simply cannot make the numbers gel. There are definitely five sheep missing. How is this even possible? His family has been in the sheep herding business for generations. They survive on the money that they make from shearing, selling, and spinning the wool from these sheep. They can't afford to simply lose sheep. 
That's money directly from the family wallet, food directly off the family table. But even worse, it's a matter of pride. He likes to think of himself as a good shepherd who cares about his flock. Losing a single sheep is a failure of his responsibility to his charges, and he can't stand it. He knows that if he returns to the farm without those five missing sheep, he's going to be in big trouble. He's already thinking about the lecture he's going to get from his father, and that's if he's lucky. One missing sheep might be forgiven, but five? He'll be lucky if his family doesn't throw him out of the house for his failure. It's imperative that he find them and bring them back. He pats the head of his trusty sheepdog. Every shepherd, of course, has a sheepdog to help them keep their flock safe. His dog has been with him for many years, and she has never failed in the past. She keeps watch over the flock as if they were her own puppies, so the shepherd thinks it very strange that his dog didn't bark to sound the alarm when the missing sheep started to wander off. Could something more sinister be at play here? Maybe someone stole his sheep. If a thief came during the night to sneak away with the lost sheep, that might explain why they were able to get away without his dog knowing. They might have been clever enough to cause some kind of distraction to keep her busy. The shepherd notices that the fence at the edge of the field is broken. This must be how the missing sheep got away. He examines the splintered wood. It's not a natural break because the wood is sturdy and far from rotten. Someone or something must have broken the fence sometime last night. He clutches at his shepherd's crook, his brow set in determination. This isn't good. It's looking more and more likely that thieves are behind this disappearance. He needs to track them down, but you will have to be careful. Sheep thieves are usually desperate men, and they might resort to violence to protect their ill-gotten gains. A glint of sunlight flashes against something shiny caught on the fence, catching the shepherd's eye. He scoops it up and examines it closely. It looks like a scrap of fabric. Could it be that the thief snagged his clothes against the fence as he made his escape? The fabric is thin and brittle, and doesn't look like any sort of material that the shepherd has ever seen before. It more resembles a scrap of snakeskin than a scrap of shirt, but it's his only lead, so it'll have to do. He holds the scrap to his dog's nose and allows her to sniff it. She snuffles at it and then immediately raises her ears, alert. He commands her to follow the scent, and she obeys. She puts her nose to the ground and starts to track. He follows her. The dog leads him out of the field and across the way. He is surprised to see that she is leading him toward a nearby forest. He gulps in sudden fear. He's never been into these woods and, in fact, his family has often warned him to stay away. Everyone in his village loves to repeat rumors that this forest is haunted, filled with every sorts of scary monsters and demons. Why would the sheep thief brave these cursed woods? On the other hand, that would make sense though, wouldn't it? A thief would need a lair that was hidden and difficult to approach so that they wouldn't have to worry about getting caught. These woods would be a perfect hiding place. Still, he can't help but wonder. His dog lifts her head and whines at him, indicating that he should follow. He steals his resolve and continues on. His fingers clutch tightly to his staff, his knuckles going white with fear and tension. He's almost convinced that he might see a monster here in these woods, and he's ready to defend himself from the worst. Eventually, his dog leads him into an unexpected clearing. The shepherd blinks in amazement. Standing at the center of the glen is what appears to be the remains of an ancient temple. He hasn't given much thought to the history of this place, to all the people who lived here in ancient times, and to what monuments they left behind. The crumbling ruins are overgrown with vines, and the columns look like they might disintegrate at a touch. He wonders what ancient civilization might have built this lost citadel, and what strange rites they might have performed here. But he doesn't have time to wonder about that because his dog is barreling ahead right through the ancient temple archway and into the interior of the building. He wants to turn and run. Everything that he's ever heard about these cursed woods makes him think that this is a very bad idea, but he knows he can't return home without those sheep. Just as he's about to enter the temple himself, he suddenly hears loud barking followed by whining and whimpering. He rushes inside and a terrifying sight meets his eyes. Indeed, it seems like his family was right when they said that these woods are full of monsters, because his dog has cornered one right here. The creature looks like an overgrown lizard with scaly skin and a long whip-like tail. Immediately, the shepherd surmises that the scrap of fabric that he found earlier didn't come from a person's clothes after all. It's obviously a piece of shed skin, no doubt from this creature. That long tail definitely looks especially snake-like, so it's no surprise to think that this thing might also shed skin just like a snake would. In the gloom of the temple, he can see his missing sheep standing in the corner, perfectly still and perfectly quiet. He's surprised to see that they're still alive. What kind of predator kidnaps its prey and then keeps it alive instead of devouring it instantly? It's also very odd that the sheep are being so still, but it's probably just that they're petrified with fear. 
The good news, though, is that if his sheep are alive, that means he can rescue them. The creature spreads a large frill around its neck as it hisses, apparently hoping to intimidate the shepherd's dog. The dog is not frightened, though, and only barks louder. She's bravely guarded the shepherd's flock for years, and she's never been one to back down from a fight, even when she's threatened by a bear or wolf. So of course, she's not going to back down from a lizard. The shepherd feels nervous being so close to this creature, simply because it's so strange. But the truth is that it doesn't look like it could do that much damage. That hissing feels like bluffing, because, realistically, what's it going to do? Bite? The shepherd is no expert, but he's never heard of a venomous lizard. He steps forward to get a better look, and the creature tenses. It's obviously nervous. It's not even that big. His dog is way bigger than this creature and shouldn't have any trouble taking it in a fight. He's seen his dog fight off rats bigger than this lizard. The creature spreads its frill again and hisses even more sharply, but that only makes the shepherd even more confident in his assessment. It's trying to look bigger than it really is, he realizes. It's trying to intimidate him. Well, that's not going to work. But then, to his astonishment, his dog stops. The dog and the creature stare at one another so intently that the shepherd thinks they are actually gazing into each other's eyes. After holding its gaze for a beat, the dog suddenly collapses. The shepherd yelps in fear and confusion. His first instinct is to run to his dog to see if she's hurt. But suddenly, the creature turns its gaze on him. He stands frozen. The creature's eyes almost seem to cast a spell on him, and he feels mesmerized, unable to move or even to think. All his thoughts drain away, and the whole world starts to fade. Nothing is real except those two malevolent red eyes. The shepherd is absolutely paralyzed. It's not just terror. He finds that he can't move a muscle. He can only watch as the strange reptile approaches his frozen dog and suddenly bites her on her exposed flank. It lashes out like a snake would when it injects venom into a victim. The shepherd was sure that there weren't any venomous lizards in this area, but now he's not so sure when he's watching this scenario play out. He expects his dog might start to convulse or spasm if she's been poisoned, but she remains completely still. Suddenly, he sees something so shocking that he's certain he must be losing his mind. Could it be? The area around the bite is starting to change color, becoming a dull gray. But as he watches, he realizes to his horror that he's not just watching a color change. This is something more. His dog is slowly petrifying, hardening, her fur stiffening into stone. She is literally turning into a statue right before his eyes. He can't move, but his eyes flick to the corner of the room where his sheep are still standing. Now he understands. It was hard to tell before, because of the darkness and also because the very idea was so preposterous that it didn't even occur to him. But the reason that the sheep were so still and quiet was because they weren't sheep anymore. They were mere statues. Somehow, this creature was able to turn things to stone with the force of its venom. He wants to scream, he wants to yell, he wants to break free and run away, but he's powerless to move. Fear wells up inside him as he sees the creature turn its attention from his rapidly petrifying dog and start to move toward him. It hisses again and strikes out, sinking sharp, needle-like teeth into his leg. The shepherd is so frozen that he can't scream, not even at the unbelievable pain as those teeth sink deep into his flesh. But the pain doesn't stop when the creature retracts its teeth. He can feel the pain spreading outward from the sight of the bite, spreading down his shins and up his legs, through his whole body. His body is hardening fast, making it hard to breathe and impossible to move. But even as he turns into a statue, he can still see everything around him, still sense the presence of the creature, still think. His thoughts aren't affected at all, other than being nearly out of his mind with terror. What could be next? The shepherd is frightened, but all he can do is wait. He's not sure how long he waits, because time has no meaning here. In the gloom of this ancient temple, he's not sure if it's day or night. He idly wonders if this temple was built for this monster, by people who worshipped it for its great and terrible power, or by people who feared it, and hoped that maybe this temple would keep it contained. Or is it mere coincidence that it's taken up residence here, just as bats might roost in an abandoned building? He has no way of ever knowing. The only indication of the passage of time is the coming and going of the creature, which, even if he can't turn his head to see its movement, he can hear its shuffling and hissing. Occasionally. He hears a sound that frightens him even more, a sound that can only be described as statuary shattering, and he wonders if that will ultimately be his fate. His question is answered one day when it seems that hunger has driven the creature to dig into its larder of petrified prisoners. The creature approaches him, and he can feel it gnawing at his feet with its big, ugly beak. It's pecking at him, harder and harder, until suddenly 
The shell breaks, and it's chewing on the flesh of his leg. Once again, the pain is unbearable, but the shepherd can do nothing but wait. At least, he thinks, it will all be over soon. Better a quick end at the jaws of a monster than a slow death trapped frozen in stone, he thinks. It's the very best that he can hope for. That shepherd had just run afoul of a creature that appears to come straight out of medieval mythology, matching the description of the deadly monster known as a cockatrice or basilisk, but the SCP Foundation knows it as SCP-1013, a nasty little piece of work with, quite literally, a paralyzing stare. SCP-1013 is a small reptile resembling a lizard, but with several key differences that set it apart from any other animal in this order. It was recovered in Egypt. An interesting coincidence, since medieval bestiaries often regard that region as the ancestral home of the basilisk. However, Foundation agents believe that since no other specimens were found in the area, that SCP-1013 is not a naturally occurring animal and might have actually been bioengineered. While SCP-1013 itself is only 60 centimeters long, its abnormally long tail measures nearly 121 centimeters long. It can use its tail to distract prey. It has a wide frill around its neck that it can extend at will, similar to that of the Australian frilled lizard. Its head does not look like any other known lizard, though, with a serrated beak and a distinctive head waddle that many researchers feel gives it the appearance of a rooster. Its beak is filled with long, needle-like teeth. But stranger than its appearance is its hunting methods. When it spies potential prey, SCP-1013 will extend its neck frill with a sudden, snapping sound. The frill appears designed to attract attention and encourage victims to look into the eyes of SCP-1013, because its eyes are, of course, where it holds its real power. The mythical cockatrice was said to be able to turn a person to stone with the power of its gaze, similar to the petrifying powers attributed to the Gorgon Medusa of Greek mythology, and SCP-1013 is very similar to its legendary namesake in this regard. Anyone or anything making direct eye contact with SCP-1013 will experience stabbing pain in most major muscle groups, followed by full paralysis setting in within three seconds and lasting up until eight minutes. It is currently unknown how SCP-1013 achieves this paralysis effect. Once its prey is paralyzed, SCP-1013 will bite its victim with its needle-like teeth, thus initiating a process of calcification. The victim will gradually stiffen and harden, almost as if they are turning into a statue. The process will begin at the site of the bite and gradually work its way through the body so that a full-grown adult will become completely calcified within 15 minutes. As of yet, there is no known way to stop or reverse the process. The calcification process only affects the outer layers of the victim, extending about 3 centimeters into the body, leaving all organs and internal tissues intact. It also does not affect the eyes or mucous membranes. This means that victims of SCP-1013 are still alive but cannot move or react. Perhaps even more horrifying, SCP-1013 then eats its victims alive. SCP-1013 feeds by breaking the hardened outer layer with its beak much like a young chick would break its way out of an egg, and then feeding on the soft tissues preserved within. The victim will experience excruciating pain as the creature eats them alive, but they cannot resist, they cannot even scream to give voice to their pain. SCP-1013 has a voracious appetite and will consume nearly twice its body weight at each feeding. Victims usually die of blood loss before SCP-1013 can complete its meal. SCP-1013 does engage in caching behavior and has been known to store petrified victims for later consumption. It prefers mammals as prey and will attack livestock and game just as readily as it will attack humans. In times when mammal food sources are not available, desperation may drive SCP-1013 to turn its paralyzing powers on fish, birds, or even insects, but it will only do this if it is near to starving. SCP-1013 is hermaphroditic and unlike other reptiles, does not reproduce sexually, but instead undergoes a process similar to budding or basic cellular division. Before reproducing, SCP-1013 will increase its feeding, gorging on food and growing rapidly in size. Eventually, it will develop cyst-like structures in its abnormally long tail, each of which contains a juvenile SCP-1013. Juvenile SCP-1013 hatch after only 48 hours, Parent SCP-1013 will typically release hatchlings within calcified prey, providing a ready food source for the juveniles until they can hunt on their own. Juvenile SCP-1013 will seek out cool, dark places like caves or abandoned buildings and begin rapid molting, doubling in size every six hours until reaching full adult size. 
Once they have reached adulthood, SCP-1013 will set out on their own and quickly establish their own hunting territories. SCP-1013 is extremely aggressive and will attack and attempt to calcify anyone that enters its enclosure, making it extremely difficult to contain. For this reason, combined with its deadly powers of calcification, SCP-1013 has been designated Object Level Keter. Any staff entering the containment area are to wear the AR-68 Armored Variant Hazmat Suit. Staff exiting the area with damaged suits are to be remanded to quarantine for one hour. Staff becoming paralyzed during cleaning, feeding, or testing cycles are to be immediately removed and remanded to medical custody until five hours after recovery. SCP-1013 is to be fed daily with one small mammal. However, any calcified animal remains are to be removed from the 1013 containment chamber and incinerated for safety reasons. 1013 is a frightening reminder that, while many entities have piercing gazes, comparatively few can end your life. Few, however, does not mean zero. The house is small, but cozy. When the realtor showed it to her, she couldn't help but notice all the flaws. The chipped paint on the door frame, the missing shingles on the roof, the cracks along the kitchen walls, even the dented old mailbox out front. But even with all those imperfections, she can't help but feel this little house is calling to her. It's where she's meant to be. This will be a home for her. The woman knows, deep in her heart, that this is what she needs to start over. It's not easy. As she moves her things into the new house, she can't help but think about her failed relationship. Every piece of furniture, every knick-knack, reminds her of her old girlfriend. She unloads a heavy box from the back of her car, but she trips over the curb as she turns toward the house. She falls, and the contents of the box spill all over the sidewalk. They're old photo albums. She quickly shoves them back into the box, doing her best to avoid looking at them. But one photo, an old vacation snapshot of her and her girlfriend visiting Niagara Falls, catches her eye as it falls out of an album. She bites her lip and wills herself not to tear up as she pushes it back into the box. How can two people who were once so close grow so far apart? The rest of the day passes in a haze. There's lots to do, what with arranging the furniture and calling up all the utilities. By the end of the day, she's exhausted and thankful to fall into bed. As she gradually drifts off to sleep, she muses on her situation. Today was the hardest day, she tells herself. Every day is only going to get easier from here on out. Time heals all wounds. The next day, she rises early. The sun is shining, birds are chirping. As she walks into her new kitchen to brew a pot of coffee, she's overcome with a sudden surge of good feelings. This house has so much potential. She could learn to live here. She could find a new love here. The world is her oyster, and she's ready for anything. Yes, she tells herself, all I needed was a good night's sleep. Now, she feels totally revitalized. A little while later, she hears the mail truck arrive and depart. Looking out the window, she sees that the delivery person has shoved the little aluminum flag into the upright position, indicating that she has mail. She ties her bathrobe around her waist and, still cradling a mug of steaming coffee in her hands, walks to that battered black mailbox at the end of the walkway. That's the first thing that ought to go, she mumbles to herself as she imagines all her plans to redecorate the house. Maybe she'll get one of those fun mailboxes that come in the shape of a wacky animal or a birdhouse. Something different, something eye-catching. Her old girlfriend never let her do anything fun. She pulls open the mailbox and pulls out a stack of envelopes. Still thinking about the possibilities for a new mailbox, she quickly shuffles through the letters, scanning the return addresses with little interest. It's mostly junk mail. That's no surprise. She just moved in, so most of her friends don't know her new address yet. But there's one letter at the bottom of the pile that has no return address. Huh, that's weird, she says. It's probably just more junk mail. She knows that some advertisers don't leave return addresses as a way to pique a recipient's interest and trick them into reading their sales pitches. Nevertheless, she's intrigued enough to tear it open. To her surprise, inside is a handwritten letter. Hello, says the letter. I couldn't help but notice you today. I'm really excited to see a new face in the neighborhood. I hope you enjoy your stay here. Maybe we could meet later? See ya. The woman blinks in confusion. This must be a welcome letter from one of her new neighbors, but since it's not signed, she really has no way of knowing which one. It's a little odd, but, well, she's sure that the letter writer must have had good intentions. She pushes the red aluminum flag back into its reclining position, holds the mysterious letter under her arm with her other mail, 
and retreats back into her new house. Imagine her surprise when, the next day, she finds another letter in her mailbox. Hi again, it says. I saw that you read my letter yesterday. I'm so glad. I was afraid that you wouldn't like me, but now I see that we're going to be great friends. Maybe you'd like to get coffee together sometime? XOXO. P.S. I really like you. Okay, now this is getting a little pushy. That first letter was friendly, if a little awkward, but this one almost sounds like someone is trying to solicit her for a date. She's in no mood for that. Even if she wasn't still hurting from her breakup, she didn't know this mysterious letter writer. Where did they get the nerve to ask her out? Angrily, she crumples up the new letter and throws it directly into the trash. She looks across the hedge, peering into the neighbor's yards. In the yard to her left, a middle-aged man pushes a lawnmower across the grass. In the yard to her right, two old women are gossiping at the fence. She feels suddenly exposed as she realizes that the letters could be coming from anyone in the neighborhood. She hopes that maybe if she ignores it, the message will be clear. She quickly scurries back into her house and slams the door shut. The next morning, she finds another message from her secret admirer together with her other mail. The tone of the letter is more desperate, more wheedling. I saw you throw away my letter yesterday, it says. Why did you do that? Don't you like me? I really thought we would make a great couple. Maybe if you gave me a chance, I could make you so much happier than your ex. The woman doesn't read any farther. She throws the letter to the ground. This is going too far. It was bad enough that a stranger was hitting on her, but now she knows that her secret admirer is a stalker too. How else would they know that she threw away their previous letter unless they were watching her as she picked up her mail? And, even more disturbing, how could they possibly know that she had troubles with her ex? She stalks over to the house next door and pounds on the door. When the middle-aged man answers, she confronts him with a letter. Did you write this? What's your problem? She demands as she shoves the paper in his face. I don't know what you're trying to do, but I'm not interested. I want you to keep away from me. I don't know what you're talking about, protests the man, holding up his hands in surrender. I, I didn't write anything. The woman doesn't know if she believes him, but she has to admit that the middle-aged man sounds genuinely confused by her accusations. Maybe he's not the culprit. But when she confronts the neighbor living to the other side, she hears a similar story. Are you sending me these letters because they're actually really creepy? I don't like people watching me, says the woman as she confronts her other neighbor. The old woman just shakes her head. Mercy me, I didn't send you a letter. Why would I do that? I could just come over and talk to you. I don't know why you youngsters are always making up stories about weird letters. The young woman wonders about the old woman's final words when she's eating dinner alone in her kitchen later that night. The way that she complained about young people always making up stories about weird letters makes her wonder if this has happened before. Could it be that other young women have lived in this house before her? And were they victims of the same stalker? But who could this stalker be? It's got to be someone close. She can just feel it. At that moment, she looks up from her meal and gasps in surprise. There, right outside her window, is the black mailbox. It's hovering right at the edge of the window, as if it's shyly peeking in, like a bashful caller afraid of being seen. The young woman blinks and rubs her eyes. When she looks again, the mailbox is gone. She rushes to the door and throws it open. The mailbox is right there, standing at the curb at the end of the footpath, just as it's always been. Are her eyes playing tricks on her? Is the stress of her breakup and the mysterious stalker finally getting to her? The next day, she finds another letter. Her stalker is getting even more unhinged, and the messages are becoming downright crazy. The next day, she finds not just one letter in her mailbox, but two. Both messages sound absolutely deranged. Her stalker, and at this point there's no doubt in her mind that a stalker is responsible for these letters, has resorted to threats. Why don't you like me? You'd better change your attitude if you know what's good for you. You think you're too good for me? What does your ex have that I don't? Maybe you need a real man to really show you the ropes. She crushes the letters in her hands, her face flushing with a combination of fear and rage. Who does this person think that they are? She can't take this pressure much longer. She's ready to report these letters to the police, but she still has no idea who's stalking her. Or does she? She can't help but think about that strange incident the previous night, when she thought that she saw the mailbox standing right outside the window. But that's crazy, isn't it? Her mailbox can't be stalking her, can it? If she tries to tell anyone that her mailbox is sending her threatening messages, everyone is just going to think that she's crazy. But soon, things start to get worse, escalating in ways that force the woman to confront that possibility. That night, she's in her kitchen fixing dinner. 
She turns from the stove to grab some condiments from the pantry. That's when she sees it. The mailbox. It's not outside this time, it's in the next room. It's standing partially hidden behind the door, again as if it's trying not to be seen. She drops her work and rushes out into the living room, hoping to catch the mailbox in the act. But it's gone. She runs to the window and, once again, sees the mailbox standing at the end of the walkway in the exact same spot that it should be. She's certain that she can't be imagining these things, but at the same time, what other explanation could there be? She barely gets any sleep that night, tossing and turning with unpleasant dreams. Several times she startles awake, sitting bolt upright in bed, half convinced that the sinister mailbox might even be in the same room with her, watching her as she sleeps. The next day, the exhausted woman rises early from restless dreams and sits on the front porch, waiting for the mail truck to arrive. When the familiar U.S. Postal Service vehicle pulls up to the curb, she stalks over and confronts the mailman. Come on, hand it over, she demands. It's my mail, give it to me. She's too flustered by this whole absurd scenario to bother being polite, and the mailman is in no mood to argue. This woman looks positively insane, he thinks. Her hair is disheveled, her eyes are ringed with heavy black circles, and she looks like she hasn't had a decent night's sleep in weeks. He has to deal with all kinds of crazy customers every day, and he knows better than to push his luck. He shoves the bundle of letters into her arms and jumps back into his truck. The woman quickly shuffles through the stack of letters, scanning the return addresses and throwing each envelope to the ground behind her when she's satisfied that it's not from her stalker. Just as she thought, none of these letters match the description of the blank envelopes that her stalker uses for his messages. She pulls open the mailbox and looks inside. To her horror, there's already a letter inside. She grabs it and feels the blood drain from her face as she looks at the blank envelope. It's another message from her stalker. Now she knows that he's sending the letters through the mail, but how did he get this letter into the mailbox without her seeing him? She woke up so early this morning, even before the sun was up, and she's been watching the mailbox for hours. It doesn't make sense that any of her neighbors could have planted this message without her knowing, but the only other possible explanation is that the mailbox itself is somehow writing these letters. She stares at the black aluminum box, the dark dented metal suddenly taking on a sinister aspect in the early morning sunlight. Maybe she really is going insane. Maybe she just misses her ex-girlfriend so much that she's imagining all this madness and just projecting her fear of being alone onto this mailbox. No, no, she doesn't believe that at all. She's going to put a stop to this, once and for all. The woman jogs into her garage and returns several moments later with a shovel. She doesn't know whether she's hallucinating or not, but she's had just about enough of this stupid mailbox. She wants it out of her life. Even if it's not stalking her, even if this is all in her mind, it's clear that there's something off about this mailbox, something that's putting her ill at ease. She starts to shovel dirt away from the base of the mailbox post, grunting and sweating with the exertion of her work, but not stopping until the post is loose. She grabs at the thick wooden post and hoists the mailbox, post and all, out of its pit. She drags it across the lawn to her driveway, where, with considerable effort, she manages to shove it into the back seat of her car, ripping the upholstery of the seats and spilling wet dirt all over the floor. She doesn't care about the damage to her car. She just needs to get rid of this mailbox. A chill runs down her spine at the thought of taking a long car ride with that thing behind her. She doesn't trust it at all, and the idea of turning her back on it well, she doesn't know what kind of danger she'll be in. As she climbs into the driver's seat, she adjusts the rearview mirror so that she can keep an eye on the mailbox for the whole trip. To her immense relief, it doesn't move once on the whole car ride, even though her nervous eyes keep flicking to the rearview mirror to assuage her fears. She finally arrives at her destination, the city dump. She pulls up to the front gate and honks her horn until the custodian comes out of the guardhouse. She motions for him to remove the mailbox from her back seat and a panicked expression on her face tells him that he should be quick about it. He's barely pulled the mailbox clear the door when the woman peels away, skidding along the curb and gunning the engine to drive away from the dump and the abandoned mailbox as fast as possible. After a few minutes on the road, she starts to calm down. She breathes a deep sigh of relief, a new sense of calm finally settling over her now that she's removed that awful mailbox from her life. She adjusts the rearview mirror to look at her reflection wincing at the sight of her haggard eyes and blotchy skin. The stress of the last few days must have been really getting to her, but now she feels like she can finally move on with her life. She manages a tense chuckle at the memory. The whole idea that her mailbox was stalking her seems increasingly absurd the further she drives from the dump, but she can't help but feel much better. But when she turns the corner to arrive at her home street, 
she sees something that she cannot believe. Her eyes bulge from her head, and her fingers tighten around the steering wheel, her knuckles going white. It can't be. The mailbox is back. The same black aluminum box and wooden post. Of course, after all she's been through, she would recognize it anywhere. It's still there, in her front yard, at the end of the walkway. But she's certain that she just dropped it off the dump, right? There's no way that she could have imagined digging up the mailbox and lugging it all the way to the junkyard. Could it be possible that the mailbox somehow followed her home? Could it be that desperate for her attention and companionship? The woman doesn't say a word. She keeps driving, passing her new home without stopping. She can't deal with this anymore. She glances at the rearview mirror. One last look at the cozy little house where she thought that she could start a new life. But she can't live like this. She keeps driving, and she doesn't look back. On the corner, the mailbox stands still and silent, as if it had never moved and never will. Dealing with a stalker can be a frightening and dangerous situation, but it can be even worse when your stalker isn't even human. That woman never had to see the mailbox again after she left the property, but the SCP Foundation is very familiar with this dangerously obsessive romantic, which it calls SCP-1269. SCP-1269 looks like a perfectly ordinary mailbox situated in front of a perfectly ordinary house somewhere in Massachusetts. It is made of black aluminum, possessing a red flag and a white plastic post. It stands at a third of a meter tall, and the house number of the corresponding property is printed on its side. It is unknown how long SCP-1269 has resided at the property, although dents and bruises on the mailbox chassis indicate that it's probably been there for some time. SCP-1269 remains a perfectly ordinary mailbox when its corresponding house is unoccupied or else occupied by a male resident. But when a woman, aged 23 years old or older, takes up residence on the property, SCP-1269 will start to manifest its anomalous properties. About two weeks after the woman moves into the house, SCP-1269 will start to manifest unaddressed romantic letters targeted towards the resident of the house. Surveillance within SCP-1269 has shown that the letters manifest approximately three seconds after mail delivery. SCP-1269's anomalous properties will manifest only when a single female, 23 years or older, hereafter referred to as the occupant, resides within the same property as SCP-1269. Approximately two weeks after the occupant moves in, SCP-1269 will start to manifest unaddressed letters every four days. The contents of the letter are romantic in nature and are targeted towards the occupant of the house. Surveillance within SCP-1269 has shown the letters manifest approximately three seconds after the occupant's mail has been delivered. At first, letters will manifest once every four days, but SCP-1269 will quickly escalate its obsessive behavior to the point that multiple letters will appear daily. The letters will become more obsessive and less coherent as SCP-1269's stalking behavior intensifies. When not under direct supervision of the house occupant, SCP-1269 will teleport to a location near the occupant and face them as if it's trying to watch them. It will always manifest in an area where it is partially obstructed, such as peeking through a window or behind some shower curtains. Sometimes, when the resident is asleep, SCP-1269 will teleport near the occupant without obstruction. SCP-1269 will not follow the occupant off the property, and all anomalous properties will cease manifesting if the occupant moves out of the house. Attempts to remove SCP-1269 from its location have so far been unsuccessful. SCP-1269 will teleport to its original curbside location after one hour of relocation. If attempts are made to replace SCP-1269 with a new mailbox, the mailbox will be teleported away with SCP-1269 appearing in its place. Approximately three hours after the disappearance of the new mailbox, it will reappear in a dumpster several kilometers away. Mailboxes recovered so far have all been found in varying amounts of disrepair within garbage bags and covered in obscene graffiti, as if SCP-1269 has become violently jealous of any other mailbox it sees as trying to replace it. SCP-1269 has also shown similar violent jealousy toward humans that it might believe are vying for the affection of any woman living in its house. In a recent experiment, a D-Class male was moved onto the property with a then-current test occupant, a D-Class female after seven weeks of residence. 
Interestingly, SCP-1269 ceased its teleporting activity in response to this male presence, but three days later, the D-Class male disappeared from the property, causing SCP-1269 to resume all anomalous behavior. Two weeks later, the body of the missing D-Class male was discovered in the same dumpster where SCP-1269 had previously disposed of rival mailboxes. The property where SCP-1269 is located is to remain under the custody of the Foundation, with one male researcher residing in the house to monitor the behavior of SCP-1269. Because of the dangerous lengths to which it will go to attain the current object of its affection, SCP-1269 has been designated with Object Class Euclid. It's our job to make sure it doesn't menace anyone else. If he breathes, the bear will see him. Lying flat on his stomach, the boy has no choice but to watch as the hulking brute eats his father before his very eyes. Lying in the thicket just a few trees away, the boy knows that any small movement he makes could prove fatal. A bear this large, hunting for its hibernation, will have no issue chasing him down in a split second and doing exactly what it did to his father, to him. The boy is utterly powerless, all he can do is stay deathly still and watch. They'd found the tracks too late. On the way back to camp, they'd been following the wooded cliff that lines the ocean's edge. Bows and salmon slung over their shoulders, they'd been so proud of their catch and the prospect of bringing it back to the tribe that they hadn't kept their wits about them. By the time they'd seen the enormous prints in the dirt, the sound of lumbering footsteps were already echoing through the trees behind them. The boy's bow is too far out of reach. He dropped it when his father pushed him into the thicket. He's got the knife hanging at his side, but he doubts it's long enough to even get through the bear's fatty hide. In contrast, the only thing protecting him from its bite is the leather hide slung across his shoulders and a woven garment from the tribe's elders. One slash of the bear's claw, and he'd be… A breeze ruffles his hair. The boy's eyes widen in horror. That wind hadn't come from in front of him, but from behind blowing his scent, his fear, directly towards the bear's nostrils. The boy plants his muddy palms into the dirt, staring at the animal. Its nostril twitches, then twitches again. It half turns its head, sniffing the air. Maybe it won't bother with him. The bear's turning back to its meal already. The boy lets out a sigh of relief, and a twig snaps. The bear snarls and whips its head around. For a second, the two of them lock eyes, predator and prey. Then the boy takes off running. Fast as he can, he leaps through the undergrowth, ferns and nettles whipping at his shins. He fumbles the knife out of its sheath and slings the water skin off his shoulder, throwing it wildly behind him. He doesn't know if he hit the bear. He doesn't have time to turn around and see. It's going to be on him in an instant. Up ahead, he sees sunlight streaming through the thick trees, the cliff edge. If he can just get to that, maybe he can climb down and… No, there's no time. Besides, bears are better climbers, better swimmers, better runners. All the boy can hope for is that he's a better jumper. Him and the boys from the tribe have left off plenty of cliffs along the shore, but never these ones. There are too many rocks, too many shallows. But the thundering of four enormous paws behind him is looming larger and larger. He can almost feel the bear's hot breath on the back of his neck. There's nothing for it. Here goes. The trees clear, the sun blasts his skin, a claw slashes at his back, and the boy launches himself into the air. The wind carries him. The weightlessness of wheeling his arms and legs through the empty sky is almost enough to make him laugh with joy, until the boy looks down. The cliff is higher, much, much higher than he'd realized. His momentum carries his torso forwards into a tumble. He's not going to land straight, and he can see jagged rocks everywhere beneath him. The boy closes his eyes and crashes into the sea. All of the air is slammed out of his lungs. His knee hits something hard and sharp in the water. A swell throws him away from the shore and pulls him deep. Without air in his chest, he can't float. Kicking hard as he can, the boy swims upwards, eyes still screwed shut. His face bashes into a sandy rock. No, that's not upwards. Which way is it? Which way should he swim? The ocean current rolls him over and over. Darkness fills his mind. But his feet find a hard surface, and he pushes against it, launching himself through the water, kicking as hard as he can. The darkness fades. Light. The boy's head breaches the water, and he splutters for air, rubbing the water out of his eyes. He looks around wildly. The sea has carried him away from the cliff and out into open water. It's lifting and dropping him with each wave, carrying him this way and that, like a flower in the wind. And there, traversing the cliff face, scrambling down the rocks, is the bear. 
The boy's stomach turns. It reaches the bottom of the cliff and sees him there in the water. Tipping back its head, it roars at an almighty volume, deafening the boy over the sound of the waters. Even from this distance, the animal looks impossibly large. It dwarfs the boulders that line the water's edge. It slips into the water, barely making a ripple, and kicks off from the shore. Going straight for him, the bear is covering the distance so fast he only has seconds left. With barely the strength to keep himself afloat, the boy knows he'll never be able to outswim this creature. Instead, he takes a deep breath and looks up at the woods, remembering all of the happy moments he'd spent in there with his father. A current swells beneath the boy and almost throws him out of the water. An enormous shadow flies through the depth beneath him. A whale? It couldn't be. Whatever it is, the shadow is swimming straight at the advancing bear. So fixated on its prey, the bear doesn't even notice what's approaching until it's too late. The ocean explodes. A blast of water as tall as the cliffs themselves shoots up into the air and showers the boy's head. Somewhere in the midst of the spray, a monster erupts from the depths. Snapping its jaw around the bear, it lifts the animal into the air and throws it against the cliff. The impact is so strong that a small landslide follows the bear's rolling body as it tumbles back towards the water. But the boy has eyes only for the monster emerging from the sea. Crawling up the rocks with one gnarled foot after another, the boy can hardly make sense of what he's looking at. It seems to have some kind of scaly hide, harder than the rocks surrounding it. A wave crashes against the monster as it leers over the bear and sinks its teeth into the animal's hide. Unable to look away, the boy kicks out and starts swimming away up the coast. Only once he's a long way around the bay does he dare to clamber out and back onto land. That night, once the rest of the tribe have gone to sleep, the boy can't help but lie wide awake in his tent. Without his father here, it's just… it's not the same. Quietly rolling up the high doorway, the boy slips out into the night. They're camped by a small cave with beautiful smooth walls inside. They say it's the cave of their ancestors, the place where all life started. The fire in the cave has to always burn. Fortunately for him, the cave is empty. The boy stares up at the wall in wonder. Finger drawings of animals, hunters, mothers, shamans, gods, and forests fill almost every part of it. Only one space remains in the corner, the finger painting of the rocky cliffs with the swelling sea beneath. Dipping his finger into the paint, the boy sits by the wall and starts to paint. A terrible monster crawling out of the sea with a scaly hide stronger than any rock. That's it. You know that from just some finger painting. The archaeologist turns to the group of researchers surrounding him in the cave. UV lights are set up all along the walls, with the blue and violet shapes revealed all across the stonework. The archaeologist can't help but empathize with the spiritualism of their long-forgotten ancestors who would lived in these caves thousands of years ago. The professor was the one who asked the question. A cold woman, standing well over six feet tall with a crop of fiery ginger hair. To him, she seems less of a scientist and more of a military leader. But what does he know? Walk with me, she says and leads him out of the cave. Personnel fills the surrounding area, most of them are armed. Cranes lift huge sheets of reinforced lead plating into place. Several mysterious vats line the edge of the forest, each adorned with more warning and hazard signs than you'd see in a nuclear power station. The two of them have to pause for a moment as three tanks roll past them. The archaeologist breaks the silence. You know the reason I started all my research in the first place? Did I ever tell you that story? Every early civilization in the world, whether it's ancient China, Mesopotamia, South America, Northern Europe, all these cultures, you take a look at their mythology and what do you find? The professor ignores him, instead choosing to bark orders at a group of agents talking over coffee. They all immediately dump their drinks and get back to work. What one thing do they all talk about, even though it never existed? Dragons. All these disparate people with no contact with one another, all of them still draw pictures of dragons. The professor stops walking at the edge of the cliff. The pair of them stand there, surveying the vast ocean stretching out in front of them, as researchers, agents, and workers rush around behind them. After a long pause, the professor asks him to proceed. In ancient Hebrew texts, when they talk about God creating the world in seven days, what happens on day five? The professor flicks the hair out of her eyes and replies curtly, God created fish in the sea and birds in the sky. Well, not exactly. Look at the original Hebrew. He created all of the fish that teem in the seashore, but he also created Leviathan, serpent-like monster from the depths, as old as the world itself. You think that's what we're dealing with? Maybe. Or something worse. 
By nightfall, preparations are operational. Enormous floodlights switch on, one after another, illuminating an enormous steel box with an open lid at the top, surrounded by armed agents, huge net launchers, and several tanks. It all seems a bit excessive as far as the archaeologist is concerned. He isn't officially still supposed to be here, but in all of the scramble for the Foundation to get the capture site ready, no one noticed that he had stuck around. From the viewing platform several hundred meters away, he has to watch it all unfold through a pair of binoculars. Out above the water, suspended from one of the cranes, is an elephant carcass. The professor told him that the Foundation had even marinated it for extra flavor. He had only been recruited into this project a couple of months ago, but from what he could tell, it's been an ongoing priority for the Foundation for several years now. The scale of the operation of just setting up at this site is already mind-boggling, but they've been chasing up leads like this for years now. Arriving at scenes, they suspect this creature has been sighted in the past and setting up traps for it. He was only brought in out of desperation. The Foundation had exhausted all recent hunting grounds and was trying to cast the net even wider. He'd just been quietly working on his university research paper about ancient reptile drawings when the agents had let themselves into his office. But staring through his binoculars now, the archaeologist knows there's no chance of this operation actually working. They have floodlights for crying out loud. No intelligent predator would come anywhere near that elephant carcass. Movement. Not in the waters or any of the lit-up areas. No, there's something in the forest line, just behind a group of researchers. He reaches instinctively for his walkie-talkie, then stops himself. How many times had he got jittery before and reported something preemptively? The agents already don't take him seriously as it is. He can't be jumping at shadows. But there it is again, a shape moving fast through the trees. He scans the binoculars this way and that, trying to find it. Just a group of researchers there, some agents there, supply crates, researchers, agents… Wait, weren't there more of them a second ago? He looks closer. Someone's gone missing. He clicks on the radio. Uh, South Lookout Team, report in. Nothing. South Lookout Team? A sickening feeling settles in his stomach. With all those bright lights everywhere, they're casting a lot of dark shadows. He has to do something fast. Running down from the lookout point, the archaeologist takes off running through the trees to the site. He holds his radio up to his mouth as he goes, trying to get anyone to respond. But it's hopeless. The thicket cracks and crunches under his feet as he tries to make his way through the dark woods, ignoring the feeling that crawls up his neck of being watched. A boulder blocks his way. The archaeologist grabs onto it with both hands and hauls himself on top of it, stopping for a moment to catch his breath. From up here, he can see the floodlit capture site. The tanks and cranes still sit rumbling ready to go at a moment's notice, but he can't see any ground crew anymore. He switches the radio to the open channel and calls out for anyone to respond. The professor's voice crackles back at him. What are you still doing here? This is a highly dangerous operation that you don't have clearance for. He yells at her to cancel it. They need to evacuate the site immediately. It's compromised. She laughs derisively and cuts off the channel. No, she has to believe him. People are dying, and more of them will if she doesn't... The archaeologist whispers to himself in the darkness. It's no monster. It's just an innocent creature. You're playing with a power you don't understand. It's strange. For a moment, he swears he almost hears a voice whispering something back to him in the woods. But when he looks around, he's all on his own. He has to keep moving. The creature could be anywhere. Hopping off the jagged boulder, the archaeologist takes off running through the forest once more, looking over his shoulder every few steps. The light must be playing tricks on him. In the darkness, he can't see the boulder he was standing on a moment ago anywhere. He bursts out of the tree line and into the clearing right next to the steel box. A ramp leads up to the top of it, with a large trap door suspended over the open lid. Well, if he wants to be seen and heard, that's where he needs to go. The archaeologist runs up the ramp and waves his hands wildly in the air. The tanks all turn their turrets to aim at him. The crane holding the enormous steel lid for the enclosure looms menacingly above his head. And there, marching out onto the field, looking absolutely furious, is the professor. Her red hair looks more like a ball of flames right now. We need to evacuate the site now! It's here! She snarls and marches up the ramp to meet him, jabbing a finger in the archaeologist's face. He suddenly realizes how much taller she is. You are not jeopardizing our one chance of catching this thing. Get out of the way, or I will have you detained. Besides, what evidence do you have? But the archaeologist isn't looking at her. Instead, his eyes stare in horror at the elephant carcass suspended behind her. There was a huge, reptilian bite mark taken out of it. A testing bite, like the ones given by sharks. She turns to follow his gaze, and all of her rage is washed away in a sickening delight. It's here. A scream from the crane holding the elephant makes them both jump. 
but by the time they look up at the cabin, all they see is a hulking shadow leaping away into the darkness. The professor clicks on her walkie-talkie and starts issuing commands. No one responds, except the tank crews. She tries again. Radio silence. Now the gravity of the situation really starts to hit her. Eyes wide with panic, she runs off down the ramp, barking into a radio and leaving the archaeologist up here on his own. Suddenly, under all of these lights, he feels very exposed. It could be anywhere in the shadows. Footsteps, heavy, planted footsteps tremor through the ground, and out of the woods walks the creature. Several meters long, fat from all of its hunting, the beast that would soon be known as SCP-682 slinks into view. It looks up at him, standing there on the trap door over a metal box, and looks like it's almost ready to laugh at how easy this will be. Boom! The tank blast hits the creature square in the torso, knocking it sideways. Boom! 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 The three tanks open fire one after the other, laying round after round into the colossal reptile, kicking more and more dust into the air. Before long, there's a crater in the ground so large that it looks almost like an asteroid hit it. Smoke and dust fill the air. The archaeologist's eyes fill with tears. That majestic creature, roaming the earth long before mankind ever did, exterminated just like that. Cowards. That's what people really are. Cowards. But as the dust clears, a groaning sound echoes around the clearing. The archaeologist shields his eyes and peers into the crater as best he can. But there's nothing there. Boom! He wheels around and almost falls backwards in shock. The SCP is snuck through the haze and leapt onto one of the tanks. It bites and tears at the armored bodywork, doing all it can to destroy it. In a panic, two of the tanks point toward one another and fire, destroying themselves in the process. The creature rounds on the remaining tank and bites down hard on the barrel. The tank fires, the round going straight down the monster's throat and exploding inside its gut. The backdraft from the blast shoots back through the tank, and a puff of smoke trails out of the hatch at the top. And suddenly, once again, the clearing is quiet. Turning back to the archaeologist, SCP-682 slinks towards him, smoke still curling up out of his leering teeth. With heavy, thunking steps, it climbs the ramp towards him stopping just short of the trap door. The two of them stare each other in the eye, predator and prey. Neither move for a moment. Then it opens its mouth. The archaeologist closes his eyes. Do you know that you disgusting creatures deserve this? He opens them. Did the monster just speak? What do they hope to accomplish by attacking me? He gulps hard that whisper he heard in the woods, the rock he'd been standing on. They're scientists. Scientists always try to learn more things, understand the world better. We think you can't be killed, so we're there testing their hypothesis. The creature growls. The stench of rotten flesh fills the archaeologist's nose. It takes a step towards him, then another. The archaeologist runs. He'll leap off the other end of the platform. It's a big jump, but he could make it. The predator's breath is on the back of his neck. He jumps, just as the trap door gives way. With an enormous thud, the SCP falls into the steel enclosure. Before it has a chance to move, the crane unhitches the steel lid, and it crashes down into place, sealing the monster inside. The archaeologist lands in the dirt and rolls onto his back to see the professor, wild-eyed and cheering, up in the crane's cabin. He lies there on his back, panting and staring up at the stars. A clunking sound echoes through the clearing and the gurgle of a liquid flowing through pipes. He sits up, adrenaline still pumping through him. The professor has plugged a pipe into the metal enclosure and is running gallons and gallons of liquid into it. He follows the tube with his eyes, all the way to the enormous hazardous vats on the edge of the clearing. Hydrochloric acid. His eyes widen in horror. The professor laughs at him. Come on, cheer up. We're just scientists, that's what you said. Just testing a hypothesis. A storm rages outside of the little old house, as inside, a little old woman bounces a little baby on her little old knee. The baby coos and laughs as the old woman makes funny faces and noises for the child, trying to keep it entertained as they wait for his parents to return from their much-needed night out by themselves. The old woman herself needs a rest now, though. He's forgotten how exhausting it can be to watch a child. Okay, that's enough. It's time for both of us to take a little nap before your parents get back. She gets up and takes the baby into a nearby room that looks as though it was a nursery at one time, but it hasn't been used for many years. 
As she goes to set the child into the crib, a strong gust of wind blows through the room. She places the baby down and rushes to the window and closes it shut. It must have been left cracked open by mistake. Burr, the room is cold from the wind, but she has just the thing to fix that. She moves to a small closet and opens the creaky door. The little old woman strains to reach up to the top shelf and feels around. Ah, there it is. She pulls down a baby blanket, a soft baby blue with colorful animals printed on it. It looks as though it's been up there for a long time, and she gives it a good shake before walking back to the crib. Look what we have here. It's your daddy's own blankie. She gives it another shake. There we go. Good as new. She leans into the crib and wraps the small helpless child in the blanket before giving him a gentle kiss on the forehead. Now you get some sleep. Your mommy and daddy will be back before you know it, and we want to show them what a good babysitter Grammy is, don't we? That way I get to see you all the time. The little old woman switches off the light and exits the room, leaving the door cracked just a few inches. She heads back to the couch and plops down on it. Almost as soon as she does, though, the baby starts crying. With a sigh, she gets back up and goes back to the nursery. What's the matter, little dear? She says as she turns the lights on. Oh no, she rushes to the crib. You've kicked your blanket off. You must be freezing. She grabs the blanket from the end of the crib and tucks it around the baby once again. There you go, that's better. The old woman leaves the room and quietly closes the door shut, leaving it open just a few inches. The moment she turns around to go back to the couch, though, the crying starts again. With a sigh, she opens the door and goes back into the room. Once again, the blanket is stuffed at the end of the crib where the baby has kicked it off. Fine, don't want a blanket, that's fine. She picks the baby up out of the crib and rocks him in her arms until it stops crying. She sets him back in the crib. There you go. No blankets. Just please get some sleep. Grammy's tired. The old woman takes the blanket out of the crib and leaves the room. She closes the door most of the way and, incredibly, this time the child remains silent. The old woman resumes her place on the couch and starts to yawn. Just as she does, the wind outside picks up and howls loudly. The old woman shivers. She looks next to her and spots the baby blanket. She picks it up and examines the cute animal print remembering when her own son was a baby wrapped in it. She smiles at the happy thought and throws the blanket around her shoulders. She leans back on the couch and finds that her eyes are growing very heavy. She'll rest them for just a moment. She won't fall asleep. She'll just rest. Mom, it's us. We're back. Thanks again for... The couple both scream when they enter the house to find that the old woman is lying face down on the floor in a pool of blood. The source of the blood is obvious. Chunks of flesh from her shoulders and upper back have been torn out, leaving jagged holes, as if she were mauled by an animal. As the man runs to the old woman, trying to do anything he can to help her, the woman runs to the nursery to find that the baby is sleeping peacefully in his crib. The woman picks up the child, tears streaming down her cheeks, and returns to the living room to see her husband kneeling beside his dead mother. Both the husband and wife are so shocked by what they have found that neither notices the baby blanket lying on the couch or that the cruel, blood-covered mouth on it is slowly fading from view until it disappears completely. There is little in life that is more comforting than a favorite blanket. Perhaps you've had the same one since you were a child, or you have a heavy one that you like to wrap yourself in when you're feeling down, or maybe it's just one that's especially fluffy and warm that you'd do anything to keep. Today's anomaly plays on those very feelings, using them against its victims to become one of the more insidious predatory anomalies in the SCP Foundation archives. This is SCP-799, also known as the Carnivorous Blanket. SCP-799 is a type of creature that can vary in shape, size, and appearance, but, as the name implies, always takes the form of a blanket of some kind. The exact material the anomaly is made out of is unknown, but it is a very soft fiber that in many ways resembles a high-quality merino wool blend, though one that retains heat even more effectively than its natural counterpart. SCP-799's weight can vary from between half a kilogram all the way to six kilograms, and while examples have been found in nearly every color imaginable, it seems predisposed towards pastels and will frequently have patterns featuring stylized, friendly depictions of various animals. Both the pastel colors and the childish patterns are especially common in instances of SCP-799 that weigh less than two kilograms and would colloquially be known as baby blankets. While SCP-799 is undoubtedly a living organism, there is some debate as to whether it is itself an animal or perhaps a type of fungal colony. 
Instances of 799 are incapable of locomotion, lying motionless for long periods of time and require little in the way of nutrition. What small amount they do need, they appear to be able to gain almost entirely from the organic particles present in normal household dust, such as animal dander and dead human skin cells. The blanket feeds via a series of minute, filter-feeding mouth-like structures that are spread across the surface of the creature, which wait for nutrients to fall into them, not unlike a sponge on the ocean floor. Instances of SCP-799 can survive for quite a while in this state, and one specimen was noted as having lived for multiple years in a damp attic, subsisting entirely on the small organic particles that would drift down from the rafters above. Should an instance of SCP-799 be forced to go for long periods of time without a source of nutrition though, like when, for example, it is placed inside of a sealed closet or drawer, it will begin to undergo certain physical changes which result in it metamorphosing into its predatory form. These changes aren't noticeable from only casual observation and consist of the blanket converting its many filter-feeding mouths into a single, large one that is lined with multiple rows of extremely sharp teeth. The blanket creature also develops a new form of tissue inside its cloth-like structure, one that is similar to muscle and capable of contracting and squeezing. Once its metamorphosis is complete, the instance of SCP-799 will lie in wait for an unsuspecting creature to cover themselves with it or wrap it around their body. Once they do, the blanket will bide its time until they enter a state of rest, usually waiting for them to fall asleep entirely, at which point its feeding phase will begin. Once the creature has detected that its victim is dormant, it will use its newly formed muscle to latch onto them, holding them in place as it opens its tooth-lined maw. It will begin to bite at its confined prey, tearing off several kilograms of flesh, bone, and any other organic material it can, swallowing it and converting it into a thin slurry that it spreads through its body almost immediately. This traumatic, violent process nearly always leads to the victim dying of blood loss. Within 10 minutes of the attack, the mouth on SCP-799 will have been completely reabsorbed, leaving no signs that it is anything other than a normal, everyday blanket, though one which now mysteriously weighs several kilograms more than it did before. By 40 minutes after the attack, the entire digestive system within SCP-799 will have demetamorphosed back into its original form, with a single digestive tract being changed once again to the many dispersed filter-feeding mouths. While SCP-799 is more than happy to feed on any warm-blooded animal, including humans, it shows no interest in cold-blooded ones or inanimate objects. It appears, then, that its senses may be limited to only touch and heat, using those as signs that it is now wrapped around a potential meal. Adding to the strangeness of SCP-799 is that it reproduces through budding, like flatworms and corals. When it has absorbed enough nutrients and sufficiently increased its mass, either very slowly through filter feeding or rapidly via its carnivorous phase, it will begin to take on a quilt-like appearance. Over several weeks, one of the quilt squares will puff up and slide off the blanket. This new, smaller instance will resemble a doily or a throw pillow, until it too begins to feed and grow. The new instance is a perfect clone of its parent, identical in every way, and it will eventually grow to a similar size and begin its own reproductive cycle. It is unknown exactly how long it takes SCP-799 to reach full maturity, but the current best guess is that when kept in its filter-feeding phase, an instance will reproduce every 50 to 60 years. Instances of SCP-799 are quite prevalent across the planet, and the SCP Foundation currently has hundreds of examples in containment. Unfortunately, it is unknown just how many still exist in the wild, as it is very difficult to identify instances, with one of the only reliable means being through genetic testing. Should any instances be located, though, they are to be destroyed immediately, as the Foundation already has a large enough population in containment for research purposes, and they pose too much of a risk both in terms of harm and exposure to the general public. SCP-799 has been classified as Euclid, and each instance is kept in its own separate biocontainment cell at Biosite 66. Dust is regularly collected from the on-site D-Class personnel dorms and is sprinkled over the blankets regularly to keep them in their filter-feeding state, though only just enough to hopefully maintain their size and not allow them to reproduce. Should any small cloth objects appear in their containment lockers, it is to be removed immediately and contained separately. SCP-799 isn't the only predatory creature that resembles a cloth good in Foundation containment and research into possible connections to SCP-1626, the oversized gray hooded sweatshirt that sends penetrating fibers into anyone unlucky enough to put it on, is ongoing. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-1051, Nevadan Extraterrestrial, 
for another anomaly with a rather unique feeding strategy. And make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single anomaly as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives.